as you know, we're doing a study exploring attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs. And just before the class, I was thinking about, I said, well, I need to tell the class a very important, make a very important point. Um, because some of you might say, might ask, or probably none of you, none of you is asking the question, but the question may arise somewhere or somehow. Um, you may ask, well, the, as it relates to the course Caribbean thought and what we are contending for this semester, because I've taught this class several times. And every single time I teach the class, I actually, uh, my approach is always a little bit different. If you were to look at what gives the last semester, the semester before that, it's a little, some of the topics I cover in those semesters is different here. I mean, um, this particular semester, I believe I'm honing in on Haiti because as a, and the Haiti as a case study when studying the Caribbean. Say, for example, the book that I wrote, Neoliberalism, Globalization, Income Inequality, Poverty and Resistance, um, which was reviewed as an erudite analysis of Jamaica's economic history. But I say to people, it's the, to, to the reviewers, the reviewers got it a bit wrong because, first of all, it's two books in one. The first part is really an economic analysis, looking at the global south as against the global north. Um, and of course, when we talk about the global south and the global north, you by now you should know what we're talking about. Um, Post-industrial countries, um, when we talk about the global north, um, and in terms of the global south, we're talking about um, developing countries, emerging economies, including countries in the Caribbean. Um, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the global south. Formerly, it was called third world, but we're moving the we language, as I said, is very important. So we're moving beyond that. But the book, Neoliberalism, Globalization, Income Inequality, so looks at the dynamics um, that are at play um, between the global south and the global north. Um, we look at we talk about income inequality and poverty, which is um, we talk we talk about the position of the Caribbean in the book, neoliberalism the position of the Caribbean, the economic position. But it started with an hypothesis. Um, if globalization is supposed to be the sine qua non, the ideal of economic development, because it was once taught by many economists, um, W. W. Rostow and many others who believe that um, uh, Economies follow a particular path. For some, it's uni, uh, it's linear. We, whatever the case is, there are stages towards development. Um, and so, when you, so if there are stages towards development, the progressive idea in as you get to the eighties, the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, was globalization, and in, if, especially in the late eighties and nineties. You, we talk about tra multinationals and transnationals and the large corporation and um, especially extending from post-industrial countries, penetrating into global South market, which has also, excuse me, created, which results in what we call, which results in high levels of income inequality and poverty. So the book, one of the most interesting thing about my book or the book that I wrote, which was a study that was conducted at the University of Pennsylvania, part of my thesis, was not just to look at the strategy, the strategy, the strategies that have created the position in the Caribbean. And I say to you, we talk about this, the reviewers say it's an area that analysis of Jamaica's economic history, but Jamaica is a case study. Jamaica offers a case study of what's, what is happening in the Caribbean, and we won't have time to delve into it this week, but next week, we are, we're coming to the end of the semester, but next week, I'll have you watch Life and Debt. The, um, I'll have you watch Life and Debt, and Life and Debt is a film um, by Stephanie Black, but the film is a documentary film, which is quite powerful and impacting. When you watch it, it it's quite powerful. And documentary films are quite revolutionary, especially when because they tell the story of they tell and they use um, uh, a particular kind of making and tools to make these kind of films. 
but it tells the story of what of what is happening in the Caribbean, how globalization has affected Jamaica. But it but the mo but the movie or the documentary film is appealing to a particular audience. The audience that they're appealing to is the tourists who travel to the North Coast. When they come to Jamaica, they only see paradise. And the, the movie looks at, and then the movie uses a lot of juxtapositions and pieces together deliberately, in a deliberate way, to show who, who, it, who are the people in 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 the in the in the in the par that um that in the on the north coast, okay, on the beaches, the beautiful beaches and so on. What are the tourists doing? Who are usually Anglo-Saxon? As again, what are the the locals doing? They're always work. They're always working, okay. So here we so of course it's put it 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 then you that you then start to question your independence, okay. But here. The, you know, the, uh, and the position of the Caribbean people and their ability to enjoy what the tourists are enjoying. And of course, and then it, the video takes you to where the, um, um, to, 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 to where the tourists are, and then it takes you to the local communities and them fighting and fight, struggling for survival. It's quite powerful. But that particular film is about, is based on a book written by Jamaica Kincaid about Antigua, <laughs> and and how globalization or neoliberal globalization, a kind of globalization that is influenced by capitalism, a capitalistic strategy, and Ramesh Ram Ramsawan from U University of West Indies, Trinidad, in Trinidad, wrote a book um, about structural adjustment. And when we get next week, the last two classes, I, I hope we have two classes left with the wrapping up class where I will talk, we'll look at the film Life and Death and I will visit, complete the time list and um, looking at people like Ramsar and Walter Rodney, so on and so forth, a little bit more, but defining structural adjustment. But he defines structural adjustment as a political ideology with an ulterior motive. Structural adjustment involving IMF and the World Bank were in the, in the 1970s because of the oil crisis in the 1970s, um, I think they had reduced oil production and so which drove up the prices. And as a result, the Caribbean, many Caribbean countries and developing countries or global South countries never had money. So now they had to go to the IMF and the World Bank. They created those banks as a result of this, but also as a result of to as a result of creating globalization. Because in a, in a, because the Caribbean now had to go to the IMF and the World Bank, ask for loans, and the money were tied to structural adjustment, some conditionalities. That's okay, a condition that says you have to open up your economy, you have to de unionize, um, you have to reduce your, you have to, um, you have to uh, um, devalue your dollar, your currency, so on and so forth. So, as to allow for penetration and for their transnationals in the US and post industrial countries to be able to penetrate these markets. Um, which also helps to create the dynamics of the global north and the global south. So anyway, the, so the Jamaica provides a case study, in a sense, of what pertains in the Caribbean and the and 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 the strategy of penetration. The strategy, and we said that, of course, we said that the book says the book is an hypothesis that says if globalization is supposed to be the sine qua non of development and growth then the Caribbean over the last 30, 40, 50 years should have experienced growth and development. If it, okay, And so the book looks at that. But then the book looks at the application of, of these strategies, the de-unionization de, de, de strategies. Um, of course, part of the plan is that the government of Jamaica and many other Caribbean countries, they have to um, um, limit the amount, how much money they spend on education, how much money they spend on, um, uh, they spend on, they invest, or in, in the local manufacturers, how much money they spend on development and so on and so forth. So part of that was to limit, so, so, so the Jamaican government hands were tied. Michael Manley talks about that in the film Life and Death um, when, you look, when we look at it next week. So that was part of the, um, part of the strategy. Um, so those, the, the, the conditionality, so they said they hand were, they, it's a, a, apply, they applied these conditions to the loan, which ultimately helped to trap the, the Caribbean, so Ramsawan and many Caribbean, um, many social scientists of the Carib in the Caribbean um, suggest that 
um, this was a plan, this was a strategy, um, it, which was, which was, which was bathed or baptized in some good, um, in, in, a, in a sense. So there, but there was some kind of ul ulterior motive, um, because according to Ramsar, Ramesh Wansawan, what what ult structural adjustment ult ult ultimately meant this transferring um, decision making from the global south to the global north. That's what structural adjustment meant in a sense, okay, and made these countries independent capitalist countries. And and um, and so that's part of so 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 it's quite interesting. So part that's part one of the book. Part two of the book look at resistance. Look at how efficient how effective is the resistance movement. If we talk about what pertains in the Caribbean today, that we have become that that um, over the last 40, 50 years, globalization hasn't really helped the Caribbean in in a, in, a, in in a sense. It has created more. In, it has um, exacerbated income inequality or. And it has created um, instability in their economic growth, uh, more poverty, so on and so forth. But in a sense, I mean, they have fluctuated. Uh, poverty sometimes high, sometimes low. But part two of the book looks at, okay, fine. What has been, what has been the response to neoliberal globalization or to, 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 to unfair competition behind globalization? Uh, which has only helped to increase the dominance that post-industrial countries have always had over their former colonies, which are now independent nations, trying to develop prosperity. And we talk about the global justice movement. We talk, of course, but we talk about we begin with looking at Marcus Garvey and um, and the civil rights movement and so on and so forth. We look at the resistance movement all the way up, and we talk about, of course, global is part of global. You know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s in the Caribbean, there was uh, this rise in, in terms of unions. BITU started what in the 1940s for Semantic Industrial Trade Union. Um, PNP had their um, their um, union as well um, in the Caribbean. Though, so unions were strong and growing, and many of the unions turned into political parties. But of course, as we get to the 70s and the 80s and the 90s in terms of with structural adjustment and with all of these loans being tied to the to conditions, part of the condition of the loan was that you can't have unions or you need to de unionize. Okay, so already, as, so as you speed towards, um, as you look at the carriage, you talk about the Caribbean, what, 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 um, what has been, how, so with all we call this countervalence, within the system, because the, so the system creates a way to prevent protestations, to prevent any challenge to their dominance or to the strategies that they have implemented. So for example, say for example, loans. So, by, so we, the, part two of the book looks at resistance or how effective is the resistance movement or the challenge to, to unfair competition and so on and so forth. And, um, and, the, and so we talk about that and we compare Marcus Garvey to Padmore and we talk about the civil rights movement. And of course, we question whether or not we really have independence, um, especially, first of all, if you talk about independence granted, then are you, I mean, independence that is granted, that means whoever grants you the independence is, is, is that continues to hold that over you. But whatever the case is, the books look, the book look at that and Part of the point I am trying to make here is when you look at this class, Caribbean thought, Caribbean thought, um, part of Caribbean, we, we've been spent much, we've spent much of the class talking about Afro-Caribbean beliefs. Um, we did skip two classes, but we spent a lot of time talking about Afro-Caribbean beliefs. And you might say, well, why are we spending so much time talking about Afro-Caribbean beliefs? And, you know, and one of the point, one of the things that, one of the things, one of the things that came to my mind was earlier was the fact that one, the Caribbean. We talk about the Caribbean being invented. Um, Norman Durbin and Brian Meeks in the Caribbean read it. They talk about the Caribbean being an invention of the, of the uh, being an invention, and what are we gonna reinvent ourselves to be? So on and so forth. Um, Rex Nestleford talks about the um our identity. 
um, what we want to be, what we hope to be, and who we are made to be. And with he talks about external, the external as against the internal. Um, and Franz Fanon talked about the issue of identity in his book, Black Skins, White Masks. And, um, and in that book, he talks about colonization being the depersonalization of the human. Um, and so when you talk about if that is colonization, so to decolonize is to rediscover the human by revisiting history and challenging that history critically. So when you study Caribbean, um, when you start to study Caribbean thinking and Caribbean thinking, Caribbean thought is looking at diverse currents in, that have come that have come to create our identity today. Part of that is that the colonial past, the colonial experience, which we, many of and we have inherited, we have inherited a colonial past. Part of that inheritance is shrouded in discrimination, inhumane, inhumanity, so on and so forth. Part of that inherited past that we still what we hold on to as part of our identity stems from theological understanding which is eurocentric theological understanding of 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 so faith and faith traditions have played a very significant role in and of course part of colonization was also to christianize okay part of colonization Part of colonization involved a, an evangelistic or missionary aspect, in a sense. Columbus was also not was also seen as a missionary, in a sense. But part of the role was also to Christianize the slaves, who were said never, they don't have religion, or if they do have religion, it's not really religion; it's something cannibalistic, animalistic, evil. And even and in 1898, of course, or in eight in the 18 late 1800s, African traditions was some African traditions were banned. But part of our understanding of life, part of our thinking, part of the we talk about diverse currents in the Caribbean, but part of the currents of the Caribbean, part of the thinking, what has shaped our thinking, of course, is our is the theology that. And much of our theology has been inherited. And so if we are going to be looking at diverse currents, we have to look at the theology, but not just theology today, but theology yesterday. And how and what, okay, and the history that has led to or created our experiences today and our attitudes and our thinking, okay, all of that. Um, of course, why we have reggae, which I mean, Rastafarianism, which was started in the 1930s, was a response to a rejection of Christianity, a rejection to the status quo, and um, in a sense, uh, of course. But we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, if we have time. I think it's 4:30. My our guest will will join the class at 5:30. Our guest will join the class at 5:30 today. So. Sorry, and I'm looking that's five yeah. thirty your time or our time. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Sorry. Uh yeah. Um wait. An hour from now. <laughs> okay. God, what time is it in Jamaica now? It's 325. Oh, okay, okay. So and it's 425 here. So yeah, he's gonna join me at 4 30. So, um, so I'm looking forward to it. You guys, I'm, I'm looking forward to that class. So, but um, before we, before, before we begin, I mean, before we, before I continue, um, look, um, looking at exploring attitudes towards Afro Caribbean beliefs. Of course, when um, the gentleman comes, he will, when Father Hyvitz comes, he will talk about um, exploring Afro Caribbean beliefs, um and voodoo and so on and so forth. We will, but at hopefully at around. 15 minutes to five, I will delve into um, Af afro cabin beliefs a little bit and in the research and so on and so forth. Um, but before I do that, part of the class, part of this class, 
as I said to you, what if you read the syllabus, we give credit. I give credit. And by the way, I did the exam. I, the exam is ready. Um, you guys gonna all you will all pass the exam. It's gonna be easy. Um, it's good when you teach a class over and over and over again. And um, I've looked at other exams and I'm like, oh my god, what a long exam! This exam was long. Oh, it's too much. So I cut it down significantly. You won't have much to do. Um, and we are going to go over some things. Um, the last class, I got to tell you for the exam, which is going to be easy. But part of this class is I give credit when students, if you were to write a paper, I mean, write, publish an article. Um, if you were to publish an article, you get the credit. And part of Caribbean thought, part of this class is to also to engage in, in, um, in discussions or dialogue of the, um, as it responding to the current event, current events or issues of the day. So whatever is happening in society, I believe, I believe we also have a responsibility as a class to, to engage that, to put our academic reflections into practice by responding and facilitating discussions. Um, and I think, so I, so part, but what, we, what we've always done is I've always invited you to public. Is there anything happening right now that you guys want to comment on? And I will probably, but, but before I, but I won't allow you guys to comment right now. I'm going to share an issue. There are, there are some major issues happening in the world today. One is immigration. Um, immigration is a big issue. Brain drain is a big issue in the Caribbean, in Jamaica. Um, and, I've, and I've said that brain drain, brain drain is, is there is a positive side to brain drain, but there's also a negative side to brain drain. Um, and of course, when you start to study remittances and, in, uh, and how remittances play a very important role in terms of the GDP of gross national income in Jamaica, especially if contributing to foreign exchange and so on and so forth. G um, uh, so remittances are, is very important. Um, and but imm so immigration is a very important issue that we have to tackle. And that's a big, that's a big issue in the Caribbean, a big issue in the Americas. Um, and so we have to talk about, I, I want to touch on immigration a little bit um, and share an article that I, that, I, that I wrote. I know some of you are also doing social work. And part of this class, as I said to you, is facilitating thinking and critical thinking as it relates to Caribbean issues, Cabin practices, tradition. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about, I want to share an article with you guys that I wrote um, looking at childhood or psychosocial development. Um, psychosocial development. And I don't and I want to probably talk about it in five minutes with you guys to find out what pertains in, in Jamaica and the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, um, as I talk about because there are serious issues here in the US, in diasporan communities and in non-diasporan communities of the Car of Caribbean um, pedigree. But um, even in Jamaica and the Caribbean, um, there are serious issues that we have to address. Part of that stems from psychosocial development. Um, there are serious criminality or the people commit, or those committing crimes, perpetrators of crimes, or crime and violence, crime and violence. Um, the perpetrator, when you start to study the per, um, those who are committing crime and violence, when you study the the the, age, the, the ages of the people committing crime today, it's it's getting young. They're getting younger and younger. Um, it's not the it's not the forty year year old or the thirty year olds. Um, now it's also and more so. The teenagers, um, a lot of teenagers are, I mean, increasingly are responsible for a lot of the crime and violence happening in societies today. Um, and in the US, in especially in black and brown communities. And so the question is, how can we deal with that as a society? And I believe that we have to, have the discussion that what what is what pertains in the Caribbean and I believe I think 
some time ago when I asked the students, why you guys come to Caribbean thought? Why are you in this class? What do you hope to, to get out of this class? I think um, there was one particular student had indicated that um, one new thing that they hope to get out of the class is to develop an approach to the practice of social work. And part of that, and I've said to the student, part of that is to explore our traditions, okay? But not just the traditions, our norms um, and our attitudes, not just towards our religious attitudes and so on, but in terms of how the family is organized, not just how the family was organized, but also looking at socialization and how that socialization is tied to a philosophy of childhood and adolescent development into adulthood. We're talking about here psychosocial development. Um, of course, Franz Fanon talks about um, um, psychosocial development of the human, especially black and brown people or the colonized man. So you guys can read um, Black Skin, White Mask or The Wretched of the Earth. He does a very good job talking about, um, in, in a sense, um, dissecting the mind, the mind of the colonized or the post-colonial. So therefore, how do you frame your, 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 your um, social work? And of course, we're talking about Obia some time ago and, and just, you know, revivalists, the revivalists, um, which is a denomination in Jamaica, um, part of their practice, they practice a form of Obia. Um, you might have people who, who you will teach or who you will come across as social workers or professionals or pastors or teachers or, um, or guidance counselors, whatever the case is, who are from a revivalist tradition. So how do you, how do you treat with that? Um, and so, so therefore, and, and I said to you, so this class is important because it helps us to consider various um, aspects of our culture um, and, and, and to develop an understanding that a lot of our, our culture is, not, is mixed in with not just um, European, but Afri people who ha are still holding on to their African traditions, many of which include some, kind, some practices which are which are which which challenge our European understanding so of how we view life. So of course I say to you today that so therefore how do you do how do you practice your social work to to the to the student or to the individual who is who who embrace Obia or embrace African traditions or is a revivalist. Of course, as I said to you, when I was younger, we walked across. If I'm passing a home that seemed to be like a revivalist home or African tradition, I would, we would cross the street or we'd run away from those persons. Of course, it breeds discrimination, of course. So, so this particular class is very important to consider that. So I'm going to share two articles that I wrote recently in response, and which, which is something I hope for you guys to develop, my ultimate goal when we end this class at the end of the course. It's not for you to pass the exam, which I'm sure you guys will pass the exam. I, on, um, I, I appreciate the discussions we're having in the class. You guys are higher level and that's great. Um, um, I know you guys are concerned about assignments and stuff. Don't be too concerned about that. I mean, you just have two things that I've asked you to do, which was to trace your heritage and a reflection of one of the classes so far that you've done. That's the only two things I've asked you to do. Probably the, the last thing I'm going to probably ask you to do. So you guys were supposed to put, um, said, send in a proposal, which is a proposal, which is really part of your final assignment. Because when you, okay, part of your final, uh, your final assignment, uh, submit a proposal of a research, of the same research we're doing. And I'm saying to you, you could look, if you go to my research gate, you can look at the proposal that I have and you could mirror that, but make it, specific to a particular area that you are going to be studying as it relates to exploring the changing attitudes to Afro-Caribbean beliefs among the people in your community, among your church, or whatever the case is. Interview 10 or 10 people or 15 people. And then um and so therefore you're so you could say, okay, this is my and you could just say the only thing that's going to be different in your proposal than the one that I have on research gate 
is um, the one. It's it's specific, not necessarily just to Jamaica. It's going to be specific to the people you are interested in. Um, so the, it's the same question. Everything is the same thing, except the demographics and so on, the, um, in terms of areas, because you are going to be, well, I mean, everything could be the same. It's just, but majority of the people is going to be spe specific to your area, to 10 people in your area community or whatever the case is or church community whatever it is or it could be among jts or student unions or whatever the case is yes alisa uh so i'm wondering with that since some of us um probably would know persons also living living overseas of jamaican parenting yes sorry <laughs> yes yes to get their perspective as well to see how it differs from our own definitely sorry yes oh my god that would be great so if you are Jamaican or live in diaspora, yes, definitely. Okay. Um, so, because I am doing research, I'm I'm interviewing people here in the US who are um who live here in the US who are from Jamaica. So that that's great. That's that's good. Um, yes, definitely. Um, I am not being too stern or strict strict on you guys this semester. I mean, I'm I provide a, a lot more latitude, which is great. Um because learning should be more flexible as we, we live in the 21st century with a lot of you guys have access to all the tools and the technology. <laughs> okay. So, um, so of course, so I, so what I've done is that some of you may not have submitted the assignment. I'm not going to um, deduct any points or whatever. Um, I'm going to give you time to do that. And if you're still working on your proposal, fine, submit the proposal. Um, but the final paper will have the proposal and the, I guess the proposal that you had submitted and the, um and with the research question at the back and your findings so um that's it um which which um if you submit your final paper with the research proposal and you didn't get it and you did not submit it during the, the semester if you have it attached to your final paper then you'll get the mid you'll get the grade for both the midterm submission which was which you um, which is which, which is part of the end of which is which is part of your final paper um so i don't think you, you so you guys don't really have you have nothing else to submit the only three pieces is to trace your heritage um to do a reflection on one of the classes or all the classes so far and the midterm to submit a midterm uh, a proposal a, a mid, uh, the midterm midterm paper which was a proposal probably two pages or three pages proposal of the research you're doing which is very easy okay Sir? Which, uh, yes, Rene. Excuse me. Good evening. Um, good evening. Is, sir, that is due on the twenty fourth of April. Is it you're referring to when it's a proposal? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. When um do how many more classes do we have? Do we have two more classes? Do, I I don't I can't recall how many more classes we have. My three. three. Yeah. Great. Oh, we have a okay. So that's enough time for me to one. Do the um do life do what have, have you guys watch the film Life and Death is very important that I have you guys watch that too, um and and then wrap up with those two lectures which I already have prepared for you, but I already have if I can't finish I send you the the document, um so I think we have enough time so that's good, so um so I'm gonna talk I'm gonna share two articles, two articles um which I wrote. And so the point I was making anyways is the point that part, so we so I want you guys to develop the attitude to start writing and by blogging doing or doing podcasts um, or you know start having dialogue and discussions that is how we you know that is how and but in a very critical way in a, um, in a very academic way yes it's very important. Um, and in a very critical way, start writing and letters to the and submitting it to the Gleaner or to a blog or to the Star or the Observer, or if you have a church newsletter, write or if you or probably create the great create a church newsletter or a church news blog or a podcast where you know you start having discussions. That I think discussions are very important, and then you frame it in a very critical way. Because that's when you people start to understand people even even more how people think. Because as much as we are the same, we're different, and it's great that we start to. I mean, you know, Barack Obama says it's, we have to start having the conversation in communities. 
con- and having dialogue, not allowing others to have the conversation for us. Um, because when you allow others to have the conversation, for say, for example, if I said if you are apolitical, to say you know the decisions that politicians make affect you, but yet you are apolitical. And so it's very important for you not just to vote, but for also for you to have the conversation and write and do your research. Um, I am doing a, I'm doing a podcast special looking at looking at um, support for either Trump or Biden among black and brown people in in black and brown communities, particularly say for example, Philadelphia. We did one in Philadelphia and um, and we we did one in New York. We released the one in Philadelphia. I'm about to release the one in New York. We're working on that. They did one in Chicago. We didn't do that one. Another group did Chicago. But um, and what we are finding is that, you know, many persons, many persons are unaware or uninformed or misinformed about what is happening um, in society. Say, for example, you know, and what the candidates represent and what voting for the cap- candidate mean and so on and so forth, just wrong ideas. And, um, but, you know, but I said, it's very important for us to start having the conversation. You talk about, look what's going on in Russia and how, and how the government deliberately and systematically and strategically um, misinform or corrupt the, the news so that they can justify certain heinous actions that they're taking all over the world. And so at the end of the day, when people talk about Russia, they said, no, Russia is bad. Not Putin. Russia is bad. Russia is, um, the Russians aren't really good people. They're evil people. They are invading Ukraine and so on and so forth. Russia, so, you know, Russia bears the name. Germans, um, not all Germans, not all Germans were Nazis, but, but I said to you, we have a responsibility to hold our government responsible. And part of doing that is becoming more informed. The Bible talks about because of, because of a lack of knowledge, the people perish. And so even if as church members, you church members have a responsibility to not just rely on the pastor. Because of course, when you look at when you study church history, when you look, when you study what di- what differentiates Catholicism from Protestantism is this very important. Catechism um, or sacrament, sorry, sacrament. The sacrament, of course, we, they don't have they don't have all the sacraments. The Protestant churches don't have all the sacraments that Catholic church that the church that the Catholics have. Okay, but what differentiates Catholicism from Protestantism and part of and part of the Reformation of the Church, which um, was the idea that of, was this idea and this philosophy, the priesthood of all believers, the priesthood of all believers, the belief that is is not just the Pope have the is not is not just the Pope the Pope is not the is not just the Pope that represent God we all represent God in a sense it's not just the Pope that can go to God or pray to God or Okay, so in a sense, if, you know, the Father, Father blesses you. You, we don't, we don't have to go to the Pope to, 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 to seek blessing. Okay, we can, we go to God ourselves, especially because of great, our, our idea of grace, our idea of salvation, so on and so forth. So, 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 so you, you find that so the church. There was a breakaway of the, in okay, so you find that the Protestant churches so we differ in terms of that particular sacrament and then that the idea of the priesthood of all believers and so on and so forth. Um, so that's that's a that's a very important point I'm making here. So it's very important for us even to have to facilitate discussions because it is by having discussions and writing and engaging each other every every day, not just yesterday. But even today, we have to continue the conversation because that because though because it will lead to it would lead to new thinking or it would it would lead to a kind of freedom which we have in a which is what creates all the denominations that we have today because of the philosophies and the thinking and the conversation. 
Um, so this is very important. So I want to share an article that I that I wrote. Um, and as it relates to what's going on in society today, um, it's called Unfair Competitive Practices, the Root Cause of Immigration Crisis. Um, because immigration is a sore issue. And it is an article written by yours truly. Um, and it was published in the Neoliberal Journals, dated April 3, 2024, uh, just recently. Um, and I submitted it to the Jamaica Gleaner for them to publish it as well, and the Jacobin Magazine here in the U.S. But um, the article says, begins like this, it says, the global immigration crisis is not a sudden phenomenon, but rather a consequence of a long history of unfair competitive practices that have exacerbated disparities and income inequalities among nations. Let me say this again. The global immigration, that's why this class is very important. This class is important, and when you start, when you read neoliberalism, I talk about the um, competitive um, economic practices, or we talk about strategy. But the global immigration crisis that we have, where especially at the U.S.-Mexico border, which many Jamaicans are also using, just so you know, many Jamaicans are using that U.S.-Mexico border crossing into the U.S. Um, countries all over the Americas. Um, crossing into the U.S., which uh, the U.S. Um, in, is, is, is a probably having, which is becoming a political issue here in the U.S. Um, in, but immigration is an is a very important issue, and actually, my 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 mic is on. Let me open open this. I'm going to make a very important point. When you study, I talk about looking at the dynamics, life is about people and how people relate. When you study Caribbean thought, when you, study, when you study society, you study in whose interest a society is constructed or who is in, in, in whose interest. Um, we, we say that life is about people and how people relate. And when you start to study, you study, you do Caribbean thought, you look at diverse thinking, but part of that thinking comes from an inher inherited past, which continues to define Caribbean today in terms of how we view ourselves and how we view others and treat others. Not only that, in terms of our economic position today as dependent capitalist societies or emerging economies, which are still grappling with our vulnerability and grappling with inconsistent growth. Um, but... Um, the point I'm making here were, um, is, so I said, the glo it's very important to when you start to look at the the position of the Caribbean in relation, the global south in relation to the global north, you can study immigration policies. And when you study immigration policies, it gives you a, an understanding in terms of the, where the Caribbean is today. Um, you look at and how the Caribbean is treated and how black and brown peoples are treated in the world today. If you look at immigration policy in post-industrial post countries towards Europeans or post-industrial countries, other post-industrial countries or countries that are predominantly, that have a predominant, um, that, that, that have a predominant particular racial makeup of white um, the immigration policy favors people from those countries. Um, you look at immigration, the immigration policy towards the Caribbean and those countries that have a majority of black and brown people, it's very draconian in terms of the conversation, the language is draconian. Um, not only that, if you look at, in, in, not only that, but it, in terms of the socioeconomics of people, the immigration policy is one that favors people who are connected, people who have ties, people who have businesses and wealth and so on and, and can contribute. So we talk about extraction, how these countries, so many glo global South countries um, are dealing with, we said that, well, the negative side of brain drain. 
is where the, many of the, the best and the brightest people are leaving these countries and, and going to the global to the global north. Um, while at the same time, these countries are being penetrated. Um, they, in, in order to export to the US or to post industrial countries, it's not, you have to meet um, all these standards, which um, is very difficult to meet, especially when these, I mean, so it's quite an interesting issue when you start to study, to study what go, pertains economically but when you study immigration not only that when you look at immigration from the global south to the global north as against immigration to the, from the global north and to the global south and um and the people who are considered illegal immigrants majority of them are black and brown people or most of them come many of them come, uh, are poor they said they okay the in in, in a sense it's it is very difficult for the, the people from the global south to go to the global north, um, especially if you're not connected and if you and if you don't have any ties. And these, and not only that, but international competition among countries have impoverished or made many of these developing countries developing. Um, uncompetitive okay to the point which exacerbate some of the e socioeconomic realities in many of these countries which is forcing many people to want to leave yet <laughs> it's, you know it's it is such a dilemma it's as if you're caught between a rock and a hard place it is the plan, it is the intention to make these countries, people from the global south, countries of the global south, or countries that are black and brown people, to make these countries poor, or poorer, or not very competitive, and make these people dependent on cheap labor, so on and so forth, while at the same time, the immigration policy is draconian. And the people who are forcing their way into, into post-industrial countries illegally are people whose socioeconomic realities in the global south is, well, I mean, they make up probably some of the poorest people or some of the people who are struggling economically. And it's quite interesting to so when you start to, and the way in which immigration works, when you look at the global south to the global north and who travels from the global south, and the word and you know majority i mean when you look at immigration from the from between global north countries or post industrial countries it's always the idea of legality but from the global south to the global north there is this idea of legality but the global immigration crisis that we that we are, that um that many countries have today is not a sudden phenomenon so i'm saying to, i'm saying to you it's not sudden but rather a consequence of a long history of unfair competitive practices, unfair competitive practices. And I said to you earlier, when you studied, when you read um, Ramesh Ramsawan, his book, Structural Adjustment, he talks about structural adjustment was really, um, was the idea behind it was to transfer decision-making from the global south to the global north. That is part of the phenomenon we are talking. That's what we're talking about. I that's part. That's part of the long history of unfair competitive practices we are talking about that have exacerbated disparities and income inequalities among nations that have created global immigration crisis today, where especially people of a particular pedigree, socioeconomic stand status in many of the global south countries, are forcing their way into the U.S., um, especially through illegal means because of the uh, because of a strict policy that limit people, certain people from certain places and people of certain pedigree to come to these countries. Post-industrial countries, particularly the United States, the UK, Canada, France, Germany, have wielded their economic power or power <laughs> to maintain to maintain dominance 
often at the expense of developing nations. Nations. Now, throughout history, post-industrial nations, throughout history, the history that we are contending for, the history that we are revisiting in this class, because that is how we are able to arrive at that through critical thinking and revisiting history. Throughout history, post-industrial nations have exploited other nations, exploited other nations. And that is not, that is a fact. When you watch the film Life and Death, we'll, um, we will talk about that and what we've all, what we've, what we've talked about. And they've exploited it also through colonization. Okay. Through embargoes, through debt. And we talk about some of the ways that many of these post industrial countries are former colonial masters continue their dominance is through what? Debt. Like what they apply, what France applied to Haiti after they got independence in 1804. They said, okay, fine. Nobody recognized the independence. So, okay. So France said, you have to pay millions and millions. At that time, it was about billions of dollars. Millions of that Haiti never had the money to pay. So, what they had to do was develop a payment arrangement. So they they were still beholden to France in a sense until I, I think it was the 1940s, I think I believe they finally paid it. Or through structural adjustment, lending monies to the Caribbean countries and applying conditionalities, <laughs> okay? Which eventually, which the conditions that they applied to the loans made them underdeveloped dependent capitalist countries, which forever prevented them from ever make, make, making the payments. So now that created a debt crisis for many of these countries, which, have, which ultimately held them down. Or through embargoes, which they applied, through, uh, they applied uh, um, to Venezuela or Cuba. Or maybe through, um, through the CIA or other... Um, operatives working incognito in some of these countries, like what happened in Grenada in the 1980s with Bishop, or what what happened um, in, in Togo uh, in the, in um, Togo sir? In the 1980s. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Trina, but I'm stepping away out of Wi-Fi zone for a bit, so I may jump for a little bit. Okay. Yes, but this sir. Class, um, we're recording, so if you don't have everything, if you don't, whatever you don't get now, you can get. Um, yeah, okay, I'll be back shortly, though. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. But, yes. um, okay. So, very important point. So, this, so throughout history, post-industrial nations have exploited other countries, extracting wealth and resources while leaving behind populations trapped in poverty. Now, this strategy has been driven by a desire to preserve competitive advantages and uphold economic dominance. Consequently, countries like Mexico, Venezuela, Hispaniola, well, Hispaniola is not a country. Hispaniola it actually has two countries. It's a land with two countries, island mass with two countries, Haiti and Dominican Republic. And those in the Caribbean have been strategically kept at a disadvantage to prevent them from rivaling the wealth and influence of more developed nations. I'm not the only, and just so you know, it's, it's not rumor what I'm saying to you now. Okay, it's not unacademic because I'm, because I'm not the only person who have arrived at that conclusion. There are several other theorists that we have contended. And, and again, um, if you read um, Nelson and Nelson, the origins of uh, democratic, the origins of um, social, the, um, the origins of democratic socialism in Jamaica. Okay, and in fact, the origins of democratic, social, democratic socialism in Jamaica was a response to the history that I'm referring to here, right, right here, in terms of post-industrial nations exploiting other countries, extracting wealth and resources, so on and so forth. Ramesh Ran Wamsawan, okay, which what Franz Fanon is talking about. So this is I'm sorry, I'm not talking about, and there are many others, um, and I have all these books here which speaks to the so I and this is something that, I, that we've studied, what we are studying in this class. So it's not hearsay or rumor. For instance, for instance, if a country 
like Jamaica, were to experience significant growth and development, attracting higher wages. Listen to the point. Follow the point here. Very important. If a country like Jamaica were to experience significant growth and development, attracting higher wages and reducing the availability of cheap labor, it would disrupt the economic balance that benefits the U.S. And many post-industrial countries and capitalists who rely on the cheap labor Capitalism is about what? If I were to, what, what's capitalism? It's about profit. If you were to study economics, what is economics? Economic is a study. Economic studies the allocation of resources. Well, I mean, that was the thinking, though. That was the thinking. When you study economics, economics is about the allocation of scarce resources among unlimited wants and desires. The problem with, with this is the unlimited wants and desires and the issue that some people privilege themselves and, and, and the issue of class and categories in society where some people put value on certain things and monopolize the things and the value so that they gain most of the limited resources that's allocated in society so now you have high levels of income inequality. Certain people that occupy a certain place in society or have certain things will make more money than other people because of the philosophy that we put in terms of how we value things. And the philosophy that we put is based in human nature of selfish, selfishness and greed. So therefore, okay, so economics is about the allocation of scarce resources among unlimited wants and desires. But the, the economics that we have, the kind of economic will determine the, how we allocate the resources. And we talk about the cap capitalists own much of the factors of production. Now, how they arrive at this ownership, according to Adam Smith, was because of hard work. But of course, Karl Marx said that's a lie in his Das Capital. Okay, when he revisited history, he said, no, that's a lie. Okay, because he said that the accumulation of capital in capitalist societies and emerging so and, um, industrial societies is a result of theft and violence. And of course, then when you start to study that, you realize, well, there's much truth to that when you start to look at serfdom and 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 what pertains and colonization and and so on and so forth and and um and what and and what continues even today and what happened in globalization and the strategy behind globalization and the international arrangements that went behind globalization that continues that that continues the that helped to continue the advantages that many countries have over others So that's a very important point. And Karl Marx challenges Adam Smith. So therefore, of course, the second book in the Neoliberalism book series is looks at neo-capitalism and the death of nations, because I said neo-capital, because cap the capitalism that we have today, even today, and the capitalism that we are supposed to have is not one that is based on competition, that is fear. I am for competition, but it has to be fair, but it is not fair. And there are ulterior motives behind many of the strategies and the arrangement and the policies, especially with the WTO and the, I the IMF and many of the international organizations and who dominate. Say, for example, the South African Prime Minister talked about... Uh, sorry, Prime Minister P.J. Patterson said one time in the 1990s, the law is not a shackle. When you look at the Security Council and the United Nations, they are, um, and how they res well, um, in the night, um, how did they respond to the in of to Israel invading Palestine? As against how 
um, how they respond to re Russia invading Ukraine. <laughs> you know, and and they talk about um, sovereignty and the rule of law, so on and so forth. So it's quite interesting. So I said, if a country like Jamaica were to experience significant, and anyway, I'm making a point about um, so economics is about the allocation of resources. And there are those who make it their business to create a system that continues your advantages based on the philosophy of the philosophy behind capitalism. Of course, they say that economics, the, the philosophy of economics that's applied. Of course, we say that um, capitalism is about, I mean, Adam Smith that said that um, the reason why some economies have wealth and turn into is because of hard work. But I said to you, that's a facade because it, the people who worked the hardest, the slaves who worked and helped to build these economies, many of them weren't paid. Many of them um, are still divorced from the riches of their labor. And I said to you, if you study some societies, um, they have certain codes and certain, and if Walter Litt from the University of Penn that looked at the economic labor of the US, of the US he talked about how in these post-industrial societies, how they created connections, connectionism. They created systems and education and licenses to protect um, certain industries, professionals. So you want to keep out people from coming to, into a particular industry to protect the wealth and so on. So they create certain licenses. They create certain you certain you labor unions or, or they create or, or not, I'm not against unions. Certain they create some some unions um, are like that. They create certain connections. If we talk about connectionism or credentialism is connected with credentialism. Okay. You have to pass certain exam and then they make it much more difficult for you to get into a particular profession because they're trying to protect certain wealth. <laughs> yeah, very important point I'm making here. Okay, and it was said throughout throughout history, post-industrial nations have exploited other nations, extracting their wealth. So I said, for instance, if so cap so we say that capital, but so capitalism is about profit. Capitalism is, is about profit, and cap capital goes wherever it can maximize and make the most profit. And supernormal profit. And the, and the multinational and transnational companies were created as a result of capital trying to maximize its gains. And so globalization created an opportunity for many post-industrial countries' corporations to expand and penetrate into other markets, especially, especially in the global south. Capital attracted OK, especially with policies now that 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 makes it easier for them to go. So capital goes wherever it can maximize and it. And what it does, it and one of the things that capital does is that it always try to minimize its costs. And one of the and the first cost that it tries to minimize is always labor. So I say to you, if in, if for for instance, if a country like Jamaica were to experience significant growth and development, attracting higher wages and reducing the availability of cheap labor, it would disrupt the economic balance that benefits the U.S. and the capitalists and the multinationals and so on and so forth. You see the point I'm making, guys? Quite powerful. It is not in the U.S., Canada, Germany, and these post-industrial countries. It is not in their interests for many of these global South countries and Venezuela and Cuba and all these countries to do very well or to become like a Singapore. It's not in their interest because now they will have to compete and they won't benefit from cheap labor. They will now have to rely on the labor in their in, in the US and the labor, labor cost is high in this country. So in a sense, illegal immigration was also beneficial. In one sense, it's beneficial because, because illegal immigrants coming here in the net. They, they drive down wages. And right now, wages were going up in the US. So in, in a sense, 
they're making the illegal immigration a political issue, but in a sense, it's an economic issue as well because many capitalists are for illegal immigration because elite, with all these migrants coming into the U.S., it will help. What it does, it creates an opportunity and it also drives down labor costs or wages. But if Jamaica is doing well and Mexico is doing well and the peoples are doing well, then there won't be a need for Jamaicans to come to and for the global south to um people to come here illegally. They will only come for vacation. And they'll okay. And not only and capital won't won't benefit from the cheap labor that's available inside Jamaica, Mexico, or inside the US if illegal immigrants aren't coming to the US or to the post-industrial country. So, so illegal immigration is in one sense a crisis, but it's that's created by unfair competition and what goes on economically in the world today. It cannot be divorced from the economic context. So, con so consequently, policies have been designed to perpetuate dependency and prevent the rise of competing economies in the global south. This is a profound point. It is the point I am making in book two of neoliberalism, neoliberal globalization, reconsider new capitalism and the death of nations, the death of nations. So when we talk about the death of nations, this is what I'm talking about, the death of nations. Neo-capitalism is not about capitalism. Capitalism is about, yes, probably, yeah, maybe it was about, it's about hard work. And, in, and the middle class was growing in one sense, but maybe it's about hard work. But capitalism is not about hard work today. What we have is neo-capitalism or what we call or a kind of neoliberal capitalism, a kind of neoliberalism, a kind of pharisaicalism, a kind of nepotism and connectionism. Do as I say, but not as I do. That's the kind of capitalism that we have that drives the, in, okay? And that's the, and that was the thrust behind all of these international arrangements, so on and so forth. The WTO was when they created WTO, that was perfect because you know what? WTO helped to end the preferential banana, the 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 the, the, the preferential agreement that many post-colonial, post-independent countries in the in the global south, in the in the West Indies had with the UK ended as a result of the WTO because the US under Bill Clinton appealed to the WTO for saying that oh that's unfair trading practices you see what I'm talking about unfair they so they created some rules but the rule but it's, it's a strategy because where is the Caribbean starting from what stage of development are they starting from? The preferential treatment benefited the Caribbean and they needed that to help to, to help them to, to come into the world economy and toward their development. But so many econ many Caribbean countries in the 90s, after 1992, and not only and let me tell you why it was in the US interest for them to end um, the banana. Um, the preferential treatment between the Caribbean because because NAFTA was they started NAFTA in the 1990s was NAFTA North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada US and Mexico and the Chiquita banana the Chiqui Chiquita banana was in Mexico and they wanted to dominate the market and may, okay and that and many investors invested in Chiquita banana in the US okay. And that was part of the North American Free Trade Agreement. So Mexico wanted to dominate. And so, so part of the agreement between Mexico and the U.S. and with NAFTA and so on was, okay, now they have banana, they want to dominate. And, and so the preferential treatment that you, the U, that the U.K. had with the Caribbean stood, was an obstacle in the kind of dominance that they wanted. And so the WTO was provided a, a useful opportunity, a great way, a strategy for them to end that because they said, oh, it didn't, it didn't apply to any rule. <laughs> but you see what I'm talking about? 
China, say for example, China. China, they created the um, some Paris Accord. Some Paris Accord that limits greenhouse emissions. Okay? And, and so when they created that, um, they were pressuring some countries to, to achieve a certain level of emission. Because, you know, um, manif so when you certain industries and so on and so forth, manufacturing, it helps, it, it, it releases certain gases and smokes that damage the ozone layer. And so they wanted countries over the world to limit that. And so many countries signed the Paris Ag Accord, but China for years refused to join that accord and broke all the rules. And in fact, part of China's argument was that for years we were developing and we were behind you cannot expect us to to agree to a a certain level that you guys can achieve because you guys don't have don't require the kind of industries now because now they're moving towards information technology and so on and you got the okay so it's e and you guys have attained a certain level of development but we are still in the middle stages or develop we are not we have we are not there yet so so you cannot expect us to 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 ascribe to to or uh, to agree to something that it's easier for you guys to attain, but it's harder for us to attain based on where we are. That should have been part of the conversation in the Caribbean as well. We talk about globalization and the WTO and the IMF and so on and so forth and, and certain agreements. Say, for example, part of the agreement between the Caribbean and um, part of the agreement between countries in, of the global south when they went to the IMF asking for money, they said um, the agreement was that, okay, you cannot invest or subsidize you can't subsidize um, uh, in milk. You can't subsidize your milk farmers and, and so on and so forth. And in the 1990s, what happened is that because of that, um, and many, Carib many Caribbean milk farmers and producers could not compete with imported milk. Okay, the subsidies were helping. So because they, were, they had to remove, the government had to remove the subsidies. So as, as a result, it killed the, the milk industry. That is... So, you don't think that the Caribbean is suffering from that today? They had to pay a price. Killed the milk milk industry. Killed the banana industry. All the workers and you know, and I was a pastor at the time in the, in the night in um sorry in the um. I was a pastor in when, when was that in two in two thousand when was it I was pastoring and there's a member of my church was talking about the banana industry and how it was really, how NAFTA and the whole Chiquita banana was created. It was really difficult for them to continue and they had to close down their, their banana farm and so on. And so many of them had to, so many, and what happened is that many of these, Canada and, Canada and so on, I guess they created the banana program where many people had go to now, go to, to, to cut, to work the farm in many of these countries. That was what they created, in a sense. But it's quite so, and or it cre or or many it created, of course, illegal, Im more illegal immigration. So that's part of the point I'm making here, as when we talk about, say, for say, for instance, if a country like Jamaica were to experience significant growth and development, distracting high wages and reducing the availability of cheap labor, it would disrupt the econ economic balance that benefits the U.S. Consequently, policies have been designed to perpetuate dependency and prevent the rise of competing economies in the global south. Moreover, post-industrial nations have flooded global markets with their products. I alluded to that a little bit just now. Undercutting local manufacturers in developing countries, which happened with the milk producers, and perpetuating a cycle of economic dependency. If these nations were to develop the capacity to compete effectively, it would threaten the profits of post-industrial countries, leading to decreased consumption of their goods. Additional, and of course, and they, it will cut their profit margin or their bottom line. Additionally, the phenomenon of brain drain further exacerbates the disparities between nations. 
The best and brightest individuals from developing countries often seek opportunities in post-industrial nations, leaving behind limited means for others. This brain drain deprives developing nations of valuable human capital while enriching post-industrial economies. Okay, you, you see, you see part of the, you see what I'm where I'm going with this. The issue of illegal immigration, particularly into the United States, the UK, Canada, France, to the post-industrial, is often framed as a problem of bro of of border security. Border, sorry, border security is often framed as a problem of border security. However, it is essential to recognize that that those crossing borders illegally are often individuals driven by economic desperation, created by what? Here we go. Unfair competition and policies that favor the privileged few. Furthermore, it's important to acknowledge that illegal immigration doesn't just represent a crisis. It also presents opportunities for some Americans to exploit. Where am I going at? Let me say that again. Furthermore, it's important to acknowledge that illegal immigration doesn't just represent a crisis. It also represents opportunities for some Americans to exploit. Border agents, for instance, have been reported charging, reportedly charging exorbitant sums to assist illeg illegal migrants ac across the border, turning the desperation of migrants into a lucrative business opportunity now, while some may use political talking points to demean immigrants, it's critical to understand that the crisis is in large part a consequence of a corrupt system that benefits certain individuals at the expense of vulnerable migrants. Some people um, unfollowed me and unfriended me and, and they're upset because of what I'm saying, but it is the truth. Let me just say this, to truly address the immigration crisis, there must be a concerted effort to rectify the structural inequalities that perpetuate poverty and drive migration. This requires a reevaluation of competitive strategies that prioritize the interests of post-industrial nations at the expense of developing countries. Now, the political will to address these issues is crucial even if it means sacrificing some advantages currently enjoyed by post-industrial nations, which I don't believe, I don't know if that's possible. Um, sir. Yes. I just have a I have a question. So I I don't disagree with anything that you're saying, but I'm wondering if while what you're saying is not impossible, if if it really is something that is achievable in well, I'm focusing on America. In an America where person the racism is still such a thing and where <laughs> it's literally against the law. Yes. Teach the truth about history. Well, look what they're doing in some country in terms of passing laws to prevent critical thinking. Right. Yes. So you know. Yeah, it's this is all theoretical, but I completely agree with you. I am what I'm talking. It's gonna be hard. Go ahead. Oh, right. That that's that's basically all I wanted to say because I'm like among their own countrymen because at this point in time there are everybody is an immigrant except for those that they have confined to reservations. Um, yes. and you're now generations in a persons who are sons of the soil for want of a better for want of a better expression, despite where their heritage is attached to. And yet there is still this sense of superiority and inferiority and uh, all of that going on all at once among your own countrymen. So it's like, if there is no regard for your fellow countrymen, why would they at all have any genuine um, or even... What's the word? Like, I, like, that's the best word I can come up with. A, a genuine interest in the well-being of persons who are from what they would call alien nations. And I'm not saying you don't have those that care. But for me, in terms of on a grand scale, I'm like, yeah. what? In America have so much problem for traffic. So it's about no, it, it's... <laughs> 
it's yes. kind of like yeah I guess that's what makes the world go round. I guess that's what makes the world interesting. The world is probably a sensational movie that the gods are watching what we are making of it. <laughs> but whatever the case is, in conclusion, the immigration crisis cannot be solved solely through border enforcement measures. It requires a fundamental shift in global economic policies and a commitment to promoting equitable development worldwide. Only then can we begin to address the root causes of migration and create a more just and sustainable world for all, which, as you said, Alyssa, I don't know it's, if that is possible. Maybe it's a utopian dream. Um, uh, as I said, it's, I guess it's utopian. <laughs> However, it's good. However, we have to continue to have the conversation and do everything we can to strive for a better world. We may not have a better world right now, but we, what we do is talk about it and strive towards it, put things in place, do whatever we can. That's the only way we can get better. To say that, well, we, it, does, it won't change, um, it won't change, but at least to talk about it and to do everything we can to start, it may shift the pendulum an inch closer to what we want, okay? And the world is, th well, according to some, the world is millions and billions of years old. And we, and, uh, and if you follow Darwinism, the, um, the world goes through some kind of uh, if evolutionary process. Um, and according, and so, and we are progressing, they say, um, from, from Homo, okay, from nothing to um, and the cell and to the Big Bang Theory and blah, 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 to Homo erectus and, um, Homo sapiens and so on and so forth. So, so maybe, so maybe it's an evolutionary process um, towards what we what we want to achieve. But um, or maybe we will cut. Or maybe maybe it is in maybe it is in maybe it is in death that we experience true. Uh, we experience. The reality of what is supposed to be, which is utopia. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, God did send his son, according to the Christian doctrine, to die for us mm -hmm. so that we, that all men can be drawn unto him. Um, and it's a process, I guess. And we talk about salvation being a process. Um, well, if you follow Calvinism, um, uh, and the theory of the already but the not yet the theology of the already but the not yet okay we will this is where i will stop so that's on immigration and you see how all what we do in caribbean thought um, tie, um how it's important for us to begin to think about these things in in serious and deliberate ways and then begin to to have conversations i submitted this i wrote this article and submitted it to the gleaner and it's also published um and this is this is some of the things I'm hoping that you guys will begin to do, start to do, write and think and brainstorm. I actually started doing um, writing, a, a tweeting, and it turned into an article. So it's quite interesting. Now, I have one more thing to discuss with you. Um, let me see if Father Iverson has joined us. Father Iverson hasn't joined us. So I need to, I need to take a break. Um, and I told him to join me at 545 because I went over. And um, there's one more thing I want to talk with you about is another article as we talk about, as if I like to talk about, I mean, comment on issues of the day or explore some of the, what's going on in society and how we can respond. One other thing that I want to talk about is the erosion of childhood. Um, the erosion of childhood and what does that look like in the Caribbean? And what, you know, and, but I talk about, I said the erosion of childhood as a, um, as a result of social media, substance use, and the crisis in psychosocial development. And I believe that um, many, I believe society seem to be, societies seem to be divorced from, from, the, from the psychology of, of human development. Um, in fact, um, there was one, if, if you guys study human development, development, development into the adult doesn't stop at 21 or 18 or some scientists or some um, social psychologists would say 14 or whatever but it continued because of course biologists are now learning that 
The frontal lobe is not developed until you're 26. The frontal lobe is responsible for executive functioning. Okay? And so, therefore, you can't expect certain young people below, be, be, um, who, are, who are not 26 before. Some people are advanced, but to fully operate in a professional way or make certain executive decisions or decisions that requires their executive functioning skill when their, the frontal lobe of their brain isn't fully developed because that is, that is partly responsible. And, you know, so that is a philosophy. That's an ideology. Now, many people may not agree with that, but scientists, and that theory is now out there and um, it's now an accept, widely accepted in academia. Um, I don't know if that sometimes theories are, are developed to justify certain inactions or to cover. So, okay, but you guys can do the study yourself. Um, but, um, or, you know, or, you, uh, and of course, or probably, I don't know, um, when, when that study came up, probably they were, there was also this new law that where it says that um, young people um, will, will stay on their parents' health insurance plan until they are 26. So I don't know if that particular new policy um, was benefited from the, the new theory of that says that um, when you're 26, that's when the exec, that's when your frontal lobe of the brain is fully developed and which is responsible for executive decision. And you can do that. I don't know if that theory was developed because as I said to you, say for example, slavery, um, just when the transatlantic slavery started in the 19, sorry, in the 1600s, late 1500s to the 1600s. Um, at the same time, what was happening was uh, the acceptance of, they found uh, a theory that was that that was developed in the in the in the middle part of the 1500s that they that became widely accepted as a theory in terms of race as a biology race is a theory it became accepted before it was not accepted in okay but it was it was just when they were a uh, they they had start they were about to start or start the transatlantic. They found this theory useful, okay, to support. So you know, so it's quite interesting. But whatever the case is, I want to talk about the erosion of childhood, social media, substance substance use, and the crisis in psychosocial development. And the point I was making is that it's very important for us to understand how people develop psychologically, socially, biologically. And it's and parenting, parenting must also take into consideration psychosocial development, social development of children, childhood development, because it will also affect their parenting. And understanding of the development of children, the development of human beings is very important in terms of then the philosophy of parenting. Because, and the philosophy of parents is important for us to safeguard society. If parenting is bad, if, if we have bad parenting, then it's going to, um, the Bible, okay, I'm going to refer to the Bible, so, or to the scriptures. But all scriptures um, um, promote that. Train up a child in the way that he should go, so that when he's old, he will not depart. Um, we talk about bad parenting and good parenting. And by training up a child, I'm not talking about beat them with a belt so that they accept your particular ideology, but um, but especially respect and value for self and for others is very important. Um, but you look at if 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 negative we look at negative parenting, and if you look at if you talk about um, I did a, I was doing some research among foster, um, foster kids and a lot of the, and a lot of people in the foster care and so on. Um, are uh, eventually become homeless and many of them turn to drugs and a lot of the black and brown communities, Philadelphia and Jamaica so on and so forth, a lot of these, you, you look at these young people and, um, and, and the parenting, a lot of people are pointing to parenting. Um, so parenting is very important and people must understand, parents must understand the, the 
the significance of their role in safeguarding the future of a society, the significance of their role in prolonging society, the significance of their role in ensuring that life continues. That is why I say, for example, we talk about the abortion. Now I'm going to tell you my, I am against abortion. That's just me. I am not saying it to, I am not making this point because I want you guys to be for or against it, but I personally am against. And the reason why I'm against abortion is because I cannot, because of, I cannot deny the arguments that I have developed against abortion. I cannot, except the only kind of abortion that probably I would consider is abortion that speaks to um, if 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 the pregnancy threatens another life. That's the only way that I if one life threatens another life. But if that if a life does not threaten another life, then we should not take the decision to destroy that life. So I'm against abort the kind of abortion I'm against. So I will, at one sense, I don't believe in a broad brush against abortion. And I'm not against abortion because of any theological, be um, because of just, well, not just, be well, yes, because of theologically. But whether as a Christian or non-Christian, but I believe that we, we are all living human beings and we have a responsibility as ethical, moral beings to protect life. Life is about people. You know, life is precious and we do not, and, and life is a gift. Um, and we are here outside of anything we have done. So I do not believe that we have a responsibility to deny or to destroy the process of life. Life is a process. It's a, and they are, okay, so life is important and we are here because of life. And I believe the moment that life starts within the womb, the moment is life itself. So I, I said to you that once the life, once life has started, we should not destroy that life because we have a responsibility as human beings to protect life because we believe that life is important. We are okay, we believe in the sanctity of life and abortion destroys the sanctity or threatens and challenges the sanctity and of life. So I believe that life is precious and it's outside of our will to destroy that life. Um, so that's my argument. Um, no, and I said to you, life is not just a, uh, we talk about raising the child, the village raises, you know, we have, um, this, the state has laws that, that talked about caring for the child, um, so on and so forth, how you reprimand the child, how you discipline the child. Children are important because the children, they become the future. They con they take and they continue with, so life is important and it, it, it has a starting point. And so just as all we and we have laws that says thou okay, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, yes. And we have laws that says high, when, when we talk about when we study ethics, higher order ethics is that the right to life. The right to life. And so now people now people, some persons who are for abortion are making it out to be. a right, a human right, in terms of the rights of the woman to make a decision. But I say to you, abortion, the decision to take a child, to take, to take, to kill the fetus or whatever, has nothing to do to, the, the decision to prevent, to, um, to make abortion illegal has nothing to do with taking away the rights or the rights of, um, the, of a woman. It has everything to do with how higher order ethics the higher order ethics is the right to life we have a responsibility to protect life higher order ethics okay the first so, and in fact anything that any behavior or action 
that threatens that higher order ethics, that ethical due to that responsibility that we have to put anything that challenges, we are against that. We say call it's evil, it's sin, whatever the case might be. So it's I I'm not making it, I'm not gonna make it into a political issue, but I'm making it in I am having a philosophical conversation about one make and it's an ethical issue. Now for some people justify that pe people some people say no it has nothing to do with ethics it has nothing to do with life um or the the sanctity of life or but that's an argument from convenience okay we okay we what we have done is that we have justified our actions by making the issue a, a woman right a woman okay so say for example the, the argument is that a woman must be able to do whatever she wants to do with her body of course a woman okay but you but you cannot kill yourself <laughs> okay because it threatens the ethic the ethics the higher order ethics life and society, as a society, we have a responsibility to protect and to preserve life because it because we have a responsibility to ensure the progression of life. Killing self threatens the progression of life. Okay, killing. So therefore, just as though, just as though, it is okay to just as though we we are okay with the idea of having a law against that protects life, the human life. Killing self. Okay. We say that fetus is also, okay, there is human life, but the, the, there's animal life, there's bird life, but the fetus is a life as well because it's part of the progression of life and we have a responsibility to protect that life. And so therefore, they are, so part of my argument is that if I, if we, as, as a society, there are some, the, we are, we, we we can do with our bodies whatever we want to do with it. However, as a society, we have a responsibility to protect, to preserve, and to ensure the progression of life. So if that if we have that responsibility, and if and if life has a starting point somewhere outside of us, in other words, okay, there the, the way we create we didn't create life. Life we came life is created. And so we see a lot, and so fetus is at, in terms of human life starts with the fetus in the womb. So as a society, we have a responsibility to protect and to preserve that life. We have that responsibility to preserve and to protect that life. It's not just the woman's right to ensure the progression of life. So there are some things where laws imposes on one's right because it is an ethical and a moral issue based in the sanctity or the ethics and the responsibility we have to protect, to preserve, and to ensure the progression of life. Okay, so, and if that is, imp and so therefore my conclusion is that we, and that's why I've, co I've concluded that abortion is, I mean, is I mean, we abortion is wrong. <laughs> okay, abortion should be made illegal. Um, so long it, so long as it does not threaten another life. Okay, um, because it is our ethical responsibility to preserve and protect any life. Um, so that's that's the point I wanted to make. So whatever the case is, and part and and I said to you, part of that is also as in terms of. Preserving life, it goes to the point of parenting. The progression of life, the preservation of life is threatened by how parents are parenting and okay, and how and what they expose their children to. And it is our responsibility to ensure that we understand the psychosocial development of children so that because it will help us to preserve and to protect life. 
And so what I've said is that in a rapidly evolving digital landscape, the traditional framework for children's psychosocial development is being eroded. The slow, deliberate exposure to stimuli that once characterized childhood has been replaced by a world where social media reigns supreme. Parental guidance is often lacking and tolerance for potentially harmful behaviors such as marijuana use is on the rise in terms of exposure, exposing children and when children start. Some people, are, I'm hearing they start at 10, 9, 8, okay? Or they are within an environment that is rife with marijuana use, use. And then, by the way, by the time the child is 11, 12, they are exposed to that and they, it's become a normal part of their everyday experiences that they are using it. And now we talk about, by the way, we talk when you start to study bi the biology of, of marijuana, it, any, uh, it, 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 is an addic it, it is addictive and it can also affect your mood and uh, it helps to create, um, it makes you very aggressive and anger, angry, especially if you, if, if you do not, um, if you are not constantly having a dose of it. So we talk about, and many of these kids don't have the kind of funding or the funds in order to, so therefore, and we talk about mental health. Many young people today are, before, we've never had, we've never had to deal with so many mental health issues. And we have a mental health crisis among our young people, whether through social media, whether through bad parenting or whether through substance abuse. And, and when you go to, by the time you get to the twenties, by the time 18, 19, 20, 21, they're dealing with mental health or many young people are be the rise in reactive behaviors, violent behaviors, aggressive tendencies. Of course, it's not just an economic issue. When we talk about relative deprivation, relative deprivation is an economic theory that says societies that have high levels of income inequality and poverty usually have high crime and violence. But there's also the, the, the use of opioids, the use of, um, um, and uh, among our young people, and um and 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 how and how it becoming you know it's so of course this, we have to have the kind of discussion this kind of discussion what happens in and and how it's destroying uh, how societies are being destroyed today in in America or in the world um what's happening in Jamaica and the Caribbean is in terms of um the erosion of childhood um are we seeing the same kind of um thing in terms of social media substance use and the crisis in psychosocial development. And um and so on and so forth. So this is very important. So anyway, I won't continue here. I'm gonna stop here because I think it's five forty-eight, and I'm supposed to be having Father Hyvison Joseph, who is here. Father Hyvison, <laughs> welcome to the class, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. How are you? How are you, <laughs> How doing? Are you doing? I'm I doing am well. well. I am well. Thank you. I am well. Hold on, let me get uh, let me turn my arm. Yes, hey. welcome to welcome to Caribbean Thought, Father Hyvison. I see you are looking like our guest. <laughs> that's great, that's great. And I hope I didn't take you get you at a very busy time because I know on Fridays you you you're very busy. Yes, I in fact that I arrived uh maybe half an hour ago. So when you asked me to come to come on you know, 15 minutes later, that was the blessing. So I had to pretty much get a chance to... Uh, I figured that it was going to be a blessing. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, I'm happy that Father Hyvison is here. Father Hyvison is a lecturer, scholar, academic, um, theologian. Um, he is uh, an, an, an Episcopal priest, as I said earlier. And um, we have become very good friends. We've done several podcast episodes together talking about what's going on in Haiti and the challenge of Haiti. Um, and we're happy to have him back because we want to know what's going on in Haiti because recently we talked about the Haitian crisis and we know that part of the problem was that we the Haitians want a more Haitian-led solution. Many of them were opposed to an installed prime minister, Dr. Ariel Henry, who is no longer the prime minister, I believe. I mean, first of all, he went to Kenya, Nairobi, to sign a treaty, which um, I was able to get that information from Father Hyvison. The next thing you know, mm -hmm. he was exiled. And, um, <clears throat> but we want to know what has happened to so him. Since then, we understand that um, he resigned. Um, but they have, but no, but lately we understand that there, there was some kind of talks between the US, um, Jamaica, and, um, and Haiti. 
and a group of trying to terms of have a, a an interim leadership. But we heard that that I heard on the news that that's collapsing. So I want to hear what what's going on since <laughs> since the prison yeah. break and all. But before you go, <laughs> but we're gonna have you. I want to hear you talk about that. But I don't know. But for probably the first the first 20, 30 minutes. And the next thing we want to end on the last thirty minutes is we want to touch on um, um, the idea of what's going on in terms of uh, what is faith and traditions in in um, in Haiti because one of the things that we were talking about is we want to, we want to explore the changing attitudes towards Afro Caribbean belief and tradition in Jamaica and the Caribbean and we know in Jamaica one of the things that the Jamaican government they, they've announced that they want to they're exploring legalizing obia many people are against that um, the church especially um, in terms of what what pertains in in Haiti I mean with voodoo and so on and so forth. And, um, and of course, we are conducting a research study on valuing African identity through religious affirmations and afro caribbean beliefs mm -hmm. and traditions. And so we're examining and exploring the change in attitudes towards Afro beliefs and traditions, African beliefs and traditions. So in Jamaica and by extension, the Caribbean. So the study aims to shed light on the impact of sociopolitical factors, religion, education, pop culture, travel experience, and exposure on the, on the evolving perceptions of um, Caribbean peoples, both in the Caribbean and in the US. And, um, and so the, the findings will contribute to a deeper understanding of how societal changes influence cultural attitudes, promoting inclusivity, tolerance, and cultural heritage, preservation, and ultimately the research aims to encourage a more informed and respectful dialogue surrounding Afro-Caribbean religion tradition in Jamaica. So I'm happy that um, my good friend and brother is here so he can help to talk a little bit about um, religious traditions in Haiti, but first, what's going on in Haiti today, and um, what's what's the latest so far? Welcome to the class, guys. Father Hyvison and uh, join us is uh, in, um, it's Alisa, Gavion, Chanel, Alan, and Felman. <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the, the quick introduction, Pastor Mackenzie, my my good friend, and. Um, yes. In the Lord, in academia, and uh, and all you know, and whatnot. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you to, uh, today and to talk about uh, those two uh, you know topics that are uh, kind of tangential. I mean, but I would like Pastor McKinsey to keep us to keep me on track, you know, because yes. I can put it. It can be easily we can award it from one to the other ones and stuff like that. But uh, we are going to talk about uh, give you an update about Haiti. Well, um, now I think we left off on uh, 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 the prime minister that was uh, installed. Yeah. That was installed. That was that was never elected. He was never elected. Uh, do you know that um, in Haiti the system we have the republican system from France. We're not. He's not supposed to be there. But uh, the, the the United States and the, what we call a core group. Uh, issued a tweet that put him in place after the assassination of the last elected president, Jovenel Moise. Now, uh, he got himself into a predicament uh, because he wanted for Kenya, he, uh, he had asked for the international community to allow Kenya to come and help the country that is now overrun uh, by gangs. So, uh, but that was uh, being challenged by the Supreme Court of Kenya. Now, he, they said that because uh, for this to happen, uh, the two countries supposed to have a bilateral, you know, treaties for Kenyan police or Kenyan military to go and help. But such treaties never uh, existed between Haiti and Kenya. Such accords never, never, never existed. So he had to go there and sign one uh, in order to get uh, the, the the force to leave Kenya to come to Haiti, and while he was over there, they shut the door on him. The police, the gang, they all tell him that he is not coming back. So he was deferred to Puerto Rico. I think that he wanted to go to Dominican Republic. So he's in Puerto Rico now. So what is happening now? The country there is nobody is warning the country. They have what we call a council of mini of ministers of, of secretary of states. They are the one who make uh, who assemble and make decisions by consensus. 
but himself, he's not, he has not technically resigned yet. He said that once they put a, a government in place, it's a mess because now he cannot enter into the country, but he's not, uh, he's not stepping down. He said that now I will step down as soon as we have a college, presidential college, like meaning that like a consensus, a con, like a, a government with different uh, representative from different sector of the of the of the nations to have a college of uh, presidential college, and then those people can go ahead and do away with uh, governing the country. So now he did say that it just because he knew uh, Haiti, we don't have a culture of working together. I don't know why, but I'm not blaming it on on slavery or anything. But we don't have a culture of working, of a political, like, you know, uh, the political elite, they don't work together. It's me and all uh, uh, myself or nobody else. Or, you know, they, they don't they don't share power well in Haiti. So I don't know if it is like maybe a, a kind of like black people mentality, a kind of like issue, I don't know. But we don't share power well in Haiti. So now he said, uh, they're gonna have a a, a, a a presidential college that of seven members that represented the most uh, influent uh, influential political parties of Haiti, the left, the the, the center, the the right, and you know what not. So they took the most the, the most uh, most influential party, political parties, and like they sent one representative. So they they uh, they build what we call like the presidential college. And then they supposed among themselves to elect a president, a president among them. So this has been done for a week since since he since he was stuck in uh, in 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 Puerto Rico. So that has not happened yet, and nobody knows when will that happen. So in the meantime, the country is just he's still the prime minister because he has not resigned. The gang is still making the law. The gangs now, I heard over that last weekend, they went into the national national library. They vandalized that and uh, and then like uh, loot everything. And they went to the uh, National Museum of Haiti. They went in there and, and took away like a lot of like uh, artworks and stuff like that. And uh, so the, the gang, so in the meantime, they are... Uh, they just impose their law on the populations. They overrun the country. The uh, the, the, the Port-au-Prince, which is the largest city in the capital, eighty percent of of of, of Port-au-Prince has been won by gang. So now uh, nobody knows what's gonna happen next or what they're gonna be doing next. So that's the situations. And the, I think that the the gang they they try two times. Let me ask the question. Two times. So, let me ask the question. Mm -hmm. Right. So right now, who is governing? Who is go? So you said that there was a council that was in yeah. They, they they put a, they put a council together, but the council hasn't been invested. So uh for it to be to be to have the power, we have like an official like uh, an official like uh, newspaper which we call like which is the official uh you know kind of like um the of the official like uh, um. Uh, the state official, like uh, um, uh, the state, the the national, the nation official uh, um, uh, journal that that publish anything that is official in the country. So if anything has to happen, they have to publish it in this to make it official. So their name, they are this this council of uh, presidential college has not been invested nor uh, published. So they are there. So they're supposed to be working and coming with uh, a roadmap where, how they're going to lead the country for the next 18 months and to do elections. They hasn't been able to do that. And they're supposed to elect one of them to be president. That hasn't been done yet. So nobody knows the country who is who is, who is running the country now. But is that constitutional and for them to have a council and elect a president like that? Is that how it works? No, it, it's not. It's not constitutional. What happened is very unconstitutional. The constitution says that uh, if there is like a vacancy of the president, 
the vice president uh, is supposed to be taking the lead. If the vice president, like the prime minister that we call it, is, if he's not available, they go to the Supreme Court and take the, 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 the chairman of the Supreme Court, like, you know, or if he's if he doesn't want it, or if he's not able to do it, they take the oldest member of the Supreme Court. So that's that's what the Constitution recognizes. But now the country is split. They want this this solution of of presidential college or council come from the international community. But Haiti want, wants, wants to go through the Constitution to go to the Supreme Court, but the international community doesn't want the Supreme Court. So now, since they are the one that that make that make the rule that uh, that move the pounds on the on the board, so what they say that's what's gonna happen. So so now that's what we have these guys now. Wait, in line wait, wait. Okay, this is to... this is interesting because I thought that everything was moving in the right direction. They did not want an installed prime minister because, of course, Haitians have a lot of pride being the first slave, yeah. I mean, free country. And so I, so he hasn't stepped down because... That was, that was, because, that was derailed. I mean, this is quite interesting. That was derailed. How is, how is... I mean... Ari, Dr. Ariel Henry is one man mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. is, who is installed... Mm -hmm. But he said he won't resign until he gets what he wants, which until, is until, to do until something the, unconstitutional. Until the which yes. is to do something unconstitutional. He wants Correct. something. Okay, while polit while gangs continue to take over and and chaos and crisis in the country because they because the people do not want Ariel. They do not want a presidential college. In other words. They don't want any external plan or strategy that deviates from their constitution, which is what you just told me, that um, if there is no president, no vice president, then we look mm -hmm. to leadership to the Supreme Court until one has been identified, which is not, is not on the table. And so as a result, Dan, why is it that the international community and everyone can't see what's happening and do what the, the constitution already have a plan which they're not following yes but yes. so why people are people are people are attacking the gangs mm -hmm. um for um for taking over the country but the gangs part of the part of the problem is that the gangs are acting out what the people are feeling in a sense mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Well, this is this, uh, this, this is interesting. Uh, the, the game, yes, yeah, it's 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 Haiti is almost like uh, it's a it's a it's a chessboard. It's a chess. If you if you can if you know how to play chess, you know, uh, it's a chess playing board. Uh, but what wh what is happening now? Now, since you have college student, like university student, in yes. the, uh, you know, uh, is listening. And guys, to um, you guys can, can if you have any questions. Then let's see your faces. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. This is deep. Go ahead, sir. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, we can understand, uh, kind of like go deeper behind from what we can we see say, to identify what's the real problems. So one thing that I may because one thing that I really like about what you're doing is that what we are saying here, you will not hear it in the news. So these, this you will never hear this in the news. The news are manipulated. The news are distorted. The news are, you know, taking side. It depends who you are listening to or which radio and which stations and who is giving it. So now we're talking about like objective voice of what is really happening. So uh, one thing that... Um, what I can say is that the core group, the core group which is leading, warning Haiti since I don't know how long, it is the embassy of all uh, six Western, you know, powerful nations: France, Germany, uh, Canada, United States, and I think uh, who else in there? Uh, there's Brazil. like five or six nations. Brazil. Yeah. They, 
But uh, yeah, uh, I, I think they, they, they might they, they kick Brazil out of it, but that's it. Friends, okay. friends, Canada, US, uh, friends, Canada, US, a uh, Germany. Germany. Hey, I think uh, there was one of the one, but one of the powerful nations that 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 keep that their hand and uh, you know cut, that kind of like crushing Haiti. So uh, now what happened is this is what happened. I will give you so this can resonate, go beyond the walls uh, of the classroom, so people can hear that. Uh, Ariel Henry is a puppet, so they put they placed him there. To do the bid, the the bidings. So whatever whatever they want to do, he does it for them. They pull they pull the string and and then Ariel dan Ariel dances. So now, if they let if they let Haiti go toward the constitution, go lean toward constitution to get one of the supreme of the of the supreme court judges, they may end up having someone. That will stand up to them. They don't want that, so they may end up having someone that is that's gonna go against their interests. They may end up having someone that rebels against them, so they don't want to take the risk of going there because once they say that you're gonna pick this one, this one doesn't want it. I mean, you know, that can derail and find into someone a leftist person. They don't want anybody from the left. You don't want anybody from the left, so they they ended up having someone that is a uh, popular, you know, kind of like uh, person and stuff like that. So they don't want that, and that's why they want to show to manipulate things to keep the, to keep things like under the grips, so that like whoever is willing Haiti, they know who that is, and then and uh, they won't have any problem with that person uh, doing the the the, the biddings. Wow, wow. Well, tell you what, this is important. Um, go live. We are going live on Facebook <laughs> because I believe that people have a responsibility to hear um, to hear what you're saying. And I will we will go live in five seconds. Well, I believe that people have a responsibility to hear um, to hear what you're saying. And I will we will go live in five seconds. We are going live, guys. On Facebook, we are live. We are live. We are live on Facebook now, and we are at the. We are got it. We are at the Caribbean. This is the Caribbean thought at the Jamaica Theological Seminary, and we have Father Hyvis Joseph, who is an Episcopal Episcopal, Episcopal priest, lecturer, professor, an academic, and uh, very and who has insider information about Haiti. And you know, this is a very important. I. We started a petition at the last Caribbean Thought class advocating for a Haitian-led solution. And if people want to sign the petition, you can go to the neoliberal.com and sign the petition. If you're in the U.S., you can go to the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, the IJ, IJDH.org. They have a petition advocating for a Haitian-led solution. I did not realize, I, th I thought that Ariel had... Ariel Henry had resigned, and we are moving towards the Haitian-led solution. But today, uh, we are hearing that Haiti is still does not have a Haitian-led solution, and there is no plan to, for a Haitian-led solution because although Ariel no. Henry, the installed prime minister, announced that he is going to resign and he is exiled in Puerto Rico now, where is mm -hmm. he now? So you're on mute. Where is he now? He's in Puerto Rico. Yes, he's in Puerto Rico. So Ariel Henry is in Puerto Rico, and um, he is asking. I he's asking for an international um, council. I thought that there a council was in place. A council is not in place. And earlier I asked you, is that constitutional? And I said to you, why yeah. is it, why aren't they following the constitution of Haiti? And and can you tell me again what is the constitution of Haiti as it relates to? Um, the succession or, of presidency or leadership. What is supposed to happen in Haiti? And you're saying that it is not happening. And that is why we have the gang taking over because for some reason, um, the international community and those who are controlling Haiti refuse to follow the Haitian people will 
to ensure, to follow the constitution so what so tell us please let's let's talk, talk about that again yes and alicia has yes. a question but tell us that yes um well i mean if i mean that was on 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 uh that was the uh my uh, uh, analysis of the sit my personal analysis of the situation going as a Haitian and that's yes. been following the the the, the for the political landscape of Haiti for yes. quite a while. So yes. I um I uh, they they um they wouldn't follow uh the constitution first of all because um they Haiti on, is under the grip of the core group. We have what we call the core group. I think that was that was uh, built. Maybe I don't know what year. I don't want to. I don't want to mistaken. But that was uh, since after Aristide, like the priest was president, like a long time ago, like you know, maybe 1991 and two thousand. Uh, we returned two thousand four. So that that's a long long time ago. But now. The core group is of the the all the five most powerful nations in the Western world. Yes, they they put their head together. They call them the friends of Haiti, but I will yes. say that the devil that is that is killing Haiti, the devil that is trying to destroy Haiti, I call them myself, because they have no plans that has to do with the with the with uh with the development of Haiti or the prosperity of Haiti. So what they do. I think that uh, they split the nation's management on, on the other. Canada is responsible for security. France is responsible for, I, I don't know, United States is uh, supposed to be helping the police. I think that uh, uh, secret, I mean, they, they split like, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, it's a piece of uh, steak, like everybody can share. So, the, everyone, every single country is responsible for a specific sector of Haiti. So that's our, now if you have a chance, you know, Pastor McKenzie, you can go ahead and read that. It should be, if you, if you type core group, uh, core group of Haiti, you know, in Haiti, they should have the, the chart, uh, the constitution that says which nation is responsible or what in Haiti. So, um, now they don't want to follow the constitution of Haiti. That says that if there is presidential vacancy, you have to go. If there is not a prime minister in place, yes. if the prime minister is is uh, is unavailable, you go to the Supreme Court, and then to get the the president of the Supreme Court right off the bat that he was the next person in line to be leading the country in case the president or vice president is not are not available there are vacancies for these people and then in case the, the the president of the supreme court does not want it or is not available for some reason or want it do you go for the most the the oldest member of the supreme court so that at least you've had somebody to to take over and then do election, I think in in eighteen months or something like that, in a year or eighteen months to do elections. So uh, that's what the constitution says right? that Article one ninety four or ninety or ninety four something like that. So that's what the constitution says. But these guys, they say that uh, well, the situation has been so dire, so we're not gonna go to the Supreme Court because we don't have any elected official in Haiti at that at that time. There is no elected official official in Haiti. All the institutions are being destroyed. So they never had election to renew or uh, any uh elected official. So there is no mayor, there is no no Senate, there is no, I mean, you know, there is none, none of these. So they said that the situation is too dire, so they're gonna have a presidential uh council college. So they sent like every political party that is the most influential political party, gonna send a representative and then they will build a, college, a, a, a presidential college. So now it's, it's it was supposed to be nine members, but it's seven. So it's seven members now. And then among themselves, they're going to elect a president of the council, and that's going to be the president of the nation as well. And then he will choose a prime minister, 
and then and then there we go and then they can go ahead and have a roadmap for elections so that's what's supposed to have happened since ariel and we got stuck three weeks ago and in in, uh, in puerto rico but now he himself while he's in exile he sees the one that's gonna give legitimacy to that college because he said that he does he does he's not resigning he will he will give he will uh he will pass on the power to this co college as uh when they are constituted but again this is a trick because everybody knows those guys are gonna be fighting till next year they will never everybody wanna be president of the thing so that's where it, that it, that things get a little mushy uh you know murky because uh, they will not agree among themselves to find the president because among the seven, everybody would want to be the president. So Ariel is waiting for them to say who is the president. So since last week, they were saying that they have a names that names never come out. So and then they keep they keep having bickering and a lot of things going on. So until now, nothing ever come out of this. Um, now. Uh, everybody is asking questions. Uh, the populations, most of the uh, sector of Haiti, they, they disagree with that. But those who agree with it, they send their representative because they are hungry for power. But most of the population, they don't, they disapprove that five, that seven member council to lead the nations because it's gonna be seven millionaire in about like six months they're gonna they're gonna like uh, they, 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 everybody says that seven millionaire like they can go they can get in poor and in seven months they're all gonna be millionaire so so that's why people are afraid that they're gonna have that so they said we want to have one person from the supreme court at least they're not gonna take so much from the country to suck the the treasure the treasure dry so uh we don't want to go beyond one or two persons. So that's why they say uh, the Haitian people against the seven member council. So, so that's where Haitians we are, are now. Against, so Ariel Henry, who is the installed prime minister who is exiled in Puerto Rico, it said he won't resign or step down, although he's exiled, unless they have a seven member council um, who will elect the president and a, and a prime yeah, minister. That's right. But that's of right. course, that's that right. is unconstitutional. And it is and Haitians are opposed to that, and um, and because they what the Haitians are um, Haitians are for is that we follow the constitution that says they elect um, that they choose yeah. the uh, um, they choose from the Supreme Court. Now, do you have a is the Supreme Court active right now? Well, the Supreme Court, I think that uh, uh, beef uh, Jovenel Moïse, that the last the last president who got we got uh, who got assassinated, he was supposed to to nominate like uh, uh, some judges to the Supreme Court for the Senate to 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 what to ratify like to 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 uh, censor them and stuff like that to sanction them and stuff, but that never happened. So Ariel, who was not was illegitimate, he's the one who I think uh, appointed. I don't know a few judges, but people say the judges are not constitutional. So this is a mess. So these judges were appointed by Ariel Henry because the constitution said a president must. You cannot be prime minister to to appoint judges to the Supreme Court. It is only the job that is defined. Uh, by the that by was supposed to be carried out by the president. So Ariel and we did that. Uh, so those guys are there, but people are kind of like uh, protesting them, saying that they were irregular because they weren't. Uh, they were never been appointed by by a president. It was a prime minister. They were now. They were never ratified by the Senate by the by by uh, by, by the Senate by Congress. So uh, uh, again, they are there. But uh, from what I heard is that uh, they found like one of the oldest judge, met Camille, Camille Le Lebrun, I think. And they said, everybody said he is credible. So I think this is, is the one that they're going to push forward since everybody trusts them, see if he will, they will accept them. But one thing I will say, even though that they do those maneuver to, to see if they can uh, one hate their own ways, Haitians are not easy to lead. So this this is once they say no 
they will not gonna go he will not gonna go they're gonna protest and take the street that's not they will do that but they will try to do it but they're gonna they're gonna make sure that that's not gonna go anywhere so that the haiti they will not uh now the, it's it's impossible to take the street because the, you don't know if the gang is against them or is for them and with the police so now but i know for sure once they realize that that's gonna happen that they're gonna take the street and make sure that they 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 get this uh dissolved but that's that uh, that's what uh, how i know haiti is so yeah so um alicia you have a question well i did Go have ahead. a question <laughs> but you uh, actually answered it father okay. so that's a yes it was answered already any question from the class so far any questions anything you want to know i have a question but um any question let me see if you guys have any question any questions i have a question um so you say that the oldest judge is the only you say that so they want the constitution um the constitution um allows for the the supreme court somebody from the supreme court to to be the yes. to occupy the space of leading the country while they try to find a president and so on mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but the judges are all um appointed by an installed prime minister who was appointed by the external group of foreigners a core group so the only Sorry. legitimate judge then there's mm -hmm. one oldest the oldest judge though there's one what's the name of that judge that you said uh i think uh kami Lebon, uh they call it like uh uh kami Lebon. last name is lebron l-e-b-r-u-n last name lebron r-u-n lebron lebron yeah okay. oh, LeBron. So that's the only and he was appointed by the prime minister i mean sorry by I think, yeah no 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 i think himself Moist. he had been there he wasn't uh he's one of the oldest members of the supreme uh, court the supreme, so he yeah. must have been in the bench for quite a while before all this thing happening so he must have been there prior to sweet mickey so he's been in the bench he's, he's been on the bench for quite a while so he was not part of uh um he was not part of those uh, uh appointed by 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 uh by our year um i understand i um so okay so so is he is he has has there been any kind of had there been a conversation or approach to this judge lebron to see if he's willing to take up the um to take take up the the position yeah i think i think yeah i think that uh, a lot of people they they rally behind him he's yeah. uh he's i think he may accept the the, the 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 charge they may accept the position but there are there are a lot of death threats there are a lot of death threats a lot of like uh you know because uh politic political is politic is dirty in haiti so while these guys they're trying to follow like uh to circumvent the way of the constitution to do their own things backed backed by the international community so when some other people who kind of like uh wanted to stay with the constitutions so they will see it kind of like they've been challenged by the other one by the other group too so so um uh he i think from the last thing i heard he's willing to take up uh that uh, challenging task but i think so far it's been really 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 challenging in terms of uh it's like they have a string and uh two groups are pulling the strings i don't know which one gonna which way is gonna sway oh wow you and you say that there's a death threat from who um he's um had you gotten oh, well, that's from people that they don't know i heard like a lot of people is uh uh, uh threatening him to uh assassinate him or whatever so oh, wow. uh, uh from but the gangs, from the gangs is that the gangs i i don't think it uh i don't know if the gang ever it might be a, it might be a gang it might be a gang because all the gangs have their own owners in haiti so that might be that may be part of the other group but uh so far uh so far uh the the uh, the, 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 the presidential college hasn't made any significant gain of uh um you know in the in the uh in their pursuits uh and then uh the people of haiti now they're trying to push for this now uh, uh from at uh from the from the from the supreme court so uh we're just waiting to see as things uh, are continue to unfold to see which way things gonna go i uh, i have several questions in terms of um 
um, you said president the presidential college. So there is a presidential college right now. Yes, it's not yet invested. So they have uh, the. I think it's been it's been uh, it's been uh, put together. They have seven. It it was it was like seven uh, seven six men one women. That lady that 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 soul that soul women that was in there she resigned because of threats death threats. Uh, and then there was another young man in there he resigned also. So they replaced them. Uh, so that uh, that college uh, that college is still there. It's still there, but he has not been invested yet. But uh, they wait until they they choose a president among themselves to turn him into the president of the nations, and then which will choose a prime minister. I don't know if it is among themselves again, or he will get added a prime minister from elsewhere. And that's why they're waiting to invest for for prime minister ariel Henry to uh turn power uh uh onto these people okay so um so this is quite interesting uh, um so right now so gangs continue to rule haiti and even yeah. if they have a council the the, the haitians are opposed to that and however but they are also opposed to the constitution having this oh, this other judge um is that correct? Yeah, uh, the, no, the, yeah. The uh, the international community is not into is not into this thing. This 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 judge. The judge. Thing. No, they're not into okay. that. Okay. So the international never, community. Never, never. Okay, they are opposed to to Haiti following the constitution in terms of appointing this judge, but Correct. they are for a council that is um, that is appointed by somebody who they appointed, which is in within their own interests. Yes, wow. and then they, they they get that done through CARICOM, which is a shame to CARICOM. It is a shame to to CARICOM. I don't know if you guys know what CARICOM is. This is the Caribbean, uh, you know, entity that kind of like get themselves uh, to uh, regional organizations that kind of like uh, political organizations that uh, that uh, that's there to help each other in when there are needs. So the Caribbean community they call it CARICOM. Um, so CARICOM is being pushed by, so you see all these entities, they work under uh, the umbrella of United Nations core group. They are the one that manipulate things. Otherwise, CARICOM should know the constitution of Haiti. What, is, what does it say in with that, with that situation? So they should know that, but they are the one that, that take that, work, that, that route with, uh, with the international community. Right, so CARICOM was established. CARICOM, um, CARICOM was established, which is the Caribbean community, and um, mm -hmm. the secretary. And CARICOM was established. I think, I think to the president democracy is preserve, Yeah, sorry. The, I think the president. Right, they, 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 they switch. They alternate the terms. I think a Jamaican is the the Jamaican president is the head of it now. Okay, so Jamaican I think I'm not sure. Of, Okay, but the, the yeah, I think the prime minister, I think your prime minister is the one that uh, that uh, that would, that is in charge. That is the president of it now, the prime minister. I think. But wasn't there a meeting? Uh, wasn't there a meeting between Caricom and the some group from Haitian core group? And yes, those what, these what are the poli po the, the, these are that's that's what out of this group comes uh, out of uh, out of this group come out these things this 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 uh, presidential college that's where that's where they took they took politicians from from uh, from the major parties who are hungry for power anyways so they all wanted to be president they all wanted to 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 take the, the, the head of the nations because they have money on it he has money in it and stuff like that so they they took those guys so those guys would never say no so, uh, but we do have some of them that says no. We do have some of those political parties. They say we're not doing this. This is unconstitutional, and they said we're not going. That, we're not going there. We're not supporting this. We're not going to send any representative to this. So you are saying that Caricom right now is following a plan that their charter is against, because Caricom is supposed to promote democracy, recognize sovereignty and democracy, <laughs> and the role of the yeah. the rule of law. Okay, but please remember yeah. the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, some time ago, a past, a past Prime Minister of Jamaica said, the law is not a shackle. <laughs> <laughs> the law yes. is not, a, but that was not a peer. That was the, 
um, Prime Minister Percival James Patterson, who was who was the um, the the leader of the of the People's National Party. But today we have uh, the the Jamaica Labour Party, Andrew Holness. He's the Prime Minister of Jamaica. He heads the um, um he heads the the CARICOM, and you're telling me that he is he is supporting um the plan by this core group which opposes CARICOM charter and so this is, and by, that is why we start the petition the, we started a petition for people on facebook we have a petition we are asking people from the caribbean community to sign the petition asking or advocating for a haitian led solution haitians yes. are prideful people prideful yes. the first yes. the first black country to secure independence and to be free. Yes. And yes. today their country is being driven by a core group of nations that is external mm -hmm. and foreign to the Asians. And they have installed a prime minister, mm -hmm. much, to, much to the protestation of the Haitians. And that is part of the reason why we have the gangs that's running the country because that's they right. are opposed to foreigners. That, that's right. Thing. And so I'm telling you, part of the problem, and for those of us who are watching on Facebook, this is a class. This is the Caribbean thought. This is an academic class. So we are an academic class contending for academic issues, exploring critical issues. And one of the issues is Caribbean issues. One of what's going on in, in and we're applying critical thinking to Caribbean thought, particularly Haiti and what's going on in Haiti. We talk mm -hmm. about post-colonial. We talk about independence, colonization. Haiti is a serious issue. What's going on in Haiti can happen to any Caribbean country today. Yeah, of and, course. Um, we <laughs> have a, and CARICOM, and and I don't know. I I hope the prime minister, the the people in Jamaica and the Caribbean, sign it. But if you're in the U.S., the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti have a petition that you can sign, asking and mm -hmm. advocating for a Haitian-led solution. The Haitians want, and of course, the, right now the the constitution is not being followed. Let me ask you: Is is Kenya? Uh, um, they went to um, Ariel. Doctor Ariel went to Kenya to ask to uh, um to. To sign to sign a treaty which mm -hmm. which which officially um engages um kenya and or joins kenya and haiti into some kind of operation so what about the troops that's, that's unconstitutional, that's, that's, that's that's unconstitutional, unconstitutional also but, yeah that's very unconstitutional like the country the constitution does not have does not allow a prime minister to engage the nation in anything like the, the like of what Ariel was doing. So uh, he did go do that, um, but that was not constitutional, that was unconstitutional as well. So, but mm -hmm. that was never happened, that that wouldn't go anywhere because the Supreme Court of Kenya challenged this in all facets. So that never go, yeah, that yeah. never went anywhere. So now they, they desisted. So they said that uh, they're not gonna go, they're not gonna go for that anymore. Especially now, since they're talking about like a presidential college and stuff like that, so we'll see. But what they, you know, you know what they did. But I'm glad you brought this uh, to uh, you. Bring, you brought that up. Is that when the when the carry come and uh, there was a meeting, I think uh, for, from the United Nations or uh, OAS. I don't know. They were having a meeting not too long ago where they did say someone who's going to be part of the college, they must be for Kenya to come. So they don't want to put anybody in this college that is against Kenya, that is against the force to come into the country. So they're already trying to set everything up in case so that yeah. they can get their wheels, you know, they can get their things going on. So they, they already put everything, their dominoes in line. You know? So they said that prior to do that, if anybody going to be part of this college, uh, presidential college, uh, you know, council, you have to be for Kenya to send group to Haiti. So all these guys, they agree for that. But those in Haiti, they never, those other parties that says, no, we don't want, Kenya to come in here. We can we can solve our problem. We need them to to uh, reinforce the police uh, and then put uh, invest in the army and then to to take care of the gang and stuff like that. We don't want another external force to come in. But uh, but this is what the uh, which is what the world the international community they want a force to come into the, the nation. That's what they want to come. Wow. So wow. This is quite powerful. This is quite yep. interesting.
So you're telling me, so I thought that, um, uh, wow, what's going on here? I thought that, um, I thought that Haiti, I thought that they were for an intervention. First, we thought that they were against an intervention force. They were, they were against Haiti. They were against Haiti is the is against interventions. I mean, yeah. if you go okay. to the core of the nation, they are against it. Uh, but so Haiti, they said they don't want an intervention force. But however, but but I thought that they relented and said, okay, fine, we would get an intervention force as long as the intervention force will help us to be able to do what we want to do in terms of follow the constitution. Mm -hmm. that, is that yeah case? well no. at, the, the, at some point i think this thing 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 things get a bit shift a bit yeah because the gang it sounds like the gang nobody nobody the gang it sounds like there is a certain coordination of the gang's activities yeah the chaos they put in the country it sounds like there was a certain coordinate correlation of coordinations so uh um uh, uh, Haiti at, so at, 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 at some point they were, they said, you know what, things are so bad. We're going to let those guys come in to give us a, a, a to give us like, uh, uh, a little area to breathe. But normally if you, if you kind of like do a, a survey, uh, most Haiti do not want the interventions, but, uh, the people were, were, uh, the, the, the popular, the mass, the mass wants it because they cannot do anything. They cannot. Uh, they they're not able to to uh, to go out, and they're not able to go do their little business and stuff like that. So they will take that. They will trade that off. At least they can have like a chance to go uh, places and a chance to breathe. But uh, nominally, or normally, they are against like you know the the, the foreign intervention. Well, I have uh, your know, doctor. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, someone put in the chat that uh, the, the the gentleman, like you know, that's that is very, that is very true. I think that uh, I think I think that uh, um, the the prime minister of Jamaica that must have been the the previous uh, term because it was Haiti. I think like uh, that was Haiti in uh, the movies was in charge the president of it when he was in power and after that i don't know who took it but uh, now that may be the president of guyana prime minister of guyana prime minister of guyana that is in charge that is uh the chairperson of it so uh all right guys i think uh now i don't know if you guys gonna push this for a little further or but at 6 30 but uh if uh i will be willing to return uh, if you have questions you can prepare them and and ask, and as this thing is unfolding, and um, and then you know, and as uh, college students, really feel free to challenge anything that I've said. But the fact remains the fact. But uh, if I have uh, my personal uh, thought to it, so feel feel free to challenge it because this is the, the space. This is the that that's what you're supposed to be doing where you are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you're supposed to accept anything at face value. You can uh, you know, uh, and. Um, and I will be, uh, you know, more than happy to return. Should fa uh, should Pastor McKenzie invite me again for another <laughs> session on Haiti? Any, As I, for the one in Bordeaux, that I think we're gonna have to postpone that. Yeah, since yeah. I plan to stay at six thirty with you guys, <laughs> so uh, uh, we will uh, we will pick that up. You know, maybe next week or in 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 couple weeks uh, to continue that debate. Powerful. Thank you so much. Any. I know Ali, uh, anybody had a burning question that they they had for for Miss for Father Hyvison. Alicia, did what you? I know you had your hand up again, or, or you were just correcting us. Oh, I was just going to mention the head of Caricom thing. That's all. all right, I'm Doctor Ali from Guyana. Thank, thank you so much. Wow, thank you, thank you. This was what. So final thing. So as it now, what? So as it now, you said that there was pandemonium in the, the gangs continue to control. Is it the gangs mm -hmm. or the police? Or the gangs? Say it again. Is it the gangs or the gangs and the police? Oh, uh, well, uh, the, the police. Uh, no, I mean it's it's a it's a very weird 
um, combination. So the police, there is like, uh, in, in fact, there is like uh, three police officers that the population just lynched because they were part of the gang. They were kind of like a co-op, like, you know, uh, a co-op, uh, you know, cop. That was like a bad, uh, kind of like a bad cop. So uh, the, the population lynched them because they are the one that uh, kind of like uh, um, went at night to, to clean the, the weapons and uh, bring, you know, kind of ammunition to them and stuff like that, or uh, tell them whenever the police is preparing something, they wait. So uh, the police and the gang, I don't know how to say that. Whether the entire the entire police force, I should say, uh, yeah. is trying to one the gang, uh, kind of like to combat the gang, but a lot of there is a lot of uh, police officers who are gang members are who are kind of like affiliated with the gang. So it's a sad situation. What about military? Uh, military? What about the military? Because I know you said that there was a, there's a small military yeah, presence. The military was, okay, yeah, the military is a very interesting thing. The military was disbanded in 1994, or no, in 2004 when Harris had returned. And then uh, United States says Haiti will not have army no more. It's going to be a police force. Okay. And then they put like an embargo, uh, 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 an arms embargo upon Haiti. But now Jovenel Moïse started an embryo of the army. We have an army of, of 1,500 people, uh, 1,500 soldiers. So this is Ill, very ill-equipped. So... Um, since the United States is not, they, they, if those guys are not for something, it's not going to go anywhere. So this this police force is just there. Sometimes they call upon them to kind of back up, to back the to back the police, like the army. Uh, but uh, they're just 1,500. They're not a lot. But uh, uh, they are at the mercy of, I don't know, Ariel uh, Henry. So... Uh, they just they're not they're not doing anything now because we they cannot purchase ammunition or weapons for them because there is an embargo an embargo upon Haiti now because they're not supposed to sell guns to Haiti uh, whereas whereas all the gangs have guns as military weapons in their hands nobody knows where, how they how they get there but uh, this is what it is uh, I think that there was like. No Mm -hmm. Wow, there's no so you have a military, but they are ill-equipped, and um, and the U.S. won't sell send any any any, no. any weapons to help you the fight. The U.S. wouldn't and... let them sell any. Uh, the, the U.S. wouldn't sell any any arms. We wanted to buy with our own money. They said no, and they said all the other country that could have sold weapon to us, they said no to them. So uh, I think Jovenel, President Jovenel, before he was assassinated, he went to Turkey from Erdogan to buy some weapons and then he purchased them and do send send them from uh, like weapons from from Turkish like you know kind of like uh military you know, weapons from Turkey and then uh when they get when the when the weapons are having Haiti uh I think the American embassy those are those are true those are true I mean I'm saying them I'm I'm saying them with my mouth because those are true because the chief of the police at that time came to the radio and uh, on uh, social media and said that. So when the weapons arrive, I'm, uh, I make an embassy call to say, no, those weapons not going to go to the army. We don't, we disagree with that. And when they ask him, where are the weapons? He said, I left them. We left them to who? They said, I don't know. I left them when I resigned. So nobody knows where these weapons Ah, uh, so I'm sure they're in the head of the gang. So, wow, this is you know, this, this, now, is, a scary, this is a this is we gotta have to do a fun. This is just and you know, guys, I talk about stability and instability. I don't know what because Haiti would benefit from an army. They benefit from a police, and with who are equipped so that they can help to me. And right now, I'm you're telling me that the U.S. and the core group they are against. The very things that would help to create stability and move Haiti Correct. to prosperity. But instead, they opt to doing something where that creates more problem for Haitians because Haitians well, are that, against does it, does it make sense? It makes sense. Wow. It makes sense. Why yeah. would they want 
why would they want peace and then they would they will equip your military Mil military will restore order if if the police is is equipped is the military is equipped they can restore order that's that make don't don't that make sense to you that they wouldn't want that they want they rather want uh uh a foreign a foreign Fair force enough. yes uh like like the un and they come and go to the beach every day they pay them like like, like outrage amount of money they go to the beach every day and then people are are, are being dead in front of them they never say anything they say well we don't come for that so uh that's what that's what they want to do like from the by like the un has done before bring cholera bring uh, uh bring a lot of like you know um uh, diseases but don't do anything that like, the situation always stay the same so that's what they want to do they want to just divert from a real solution for the problems so that we or we keep turning around like a vicious circle on the same problem so that's why they don't uh they, they, they disagree to have like a military to equip the military to equip the police uh to to solve uh to have a sol a Haitian led solution they're not for that so that that should make sense to you yeah well thank you we're, and we won't hold you anymore there's so much to talk about but thank you so much um who wants to do the all right guys it was my wait pleasure. wait wait vote of somebody one of the members of the class will do a vote of thanks anybody wants to do a vote of um who wants to lead the do the vote of thanks who wants to do that Anybody from the class wants to lead the vote of Alisa? Since you have been most vocal, you can do the vote of thanks. Yes. Okay, no problem. Father Harbinson, on behalf of the Caribbean Thought Class at Jamaica Theological Seminary in the year 2024, we'd like to thank you for taking time out of what I'm sure is a very busy schedule to come and share with us. It was very, very enlightening. Uh, there are a lot of... <laughs> A lot of shock was coming out of what you said, and and you are very right that a lot of it um would not be shared in the media. So thank you for coming, thank you for sharing with us, uh, and we we hope that you know you enjoy the rest of your day, have a great weekend, and we do hope that you'd be able to come and share with us again because this really does feel like a very incomplete conversation, but still very fruitful. <laughs> There's so much yes, to talk indeed. about. Yes, yes I want to talk about what finance like. Oh, I mean, how, what's happening in the country in terms of are people going to the stores? Are people working? Are people getting paid? Um, what is going on? How are people um, living and surviving? Yes. Wow. It's, it's hard. Yes. That would be interesting, but uh, it is. You can imagine. <laughs> All right. Yes. Thank you so much. We'll do a part two. We'll, 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 we'll have you back. You very much. Come on. Thank All you, right. guys. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Father Harrison. Take care. Yeah. Bye -bye. Guys, Take what care. a what a yeah, man. Thank you. What a powerful presentation from Father Um Harrison. Wow. You know, I'm so happy that we did that um that lecture earlier. I talked about unfair competi competition and the immigration issue. Remember, we talked about and the strategy behind and we talked about neoliberal globalization. It's quite powerful. And you know, I you know, I said that Haitians are opposed. Haitians have a lot of pride. They want freedom. They want the independence. They want the ability to to di to di to carve out their own future. They want to be able to lead their own independence. They want the democracy that they fought for so bravely and beat out the France. They have a police force. They have an army. They need the equipment. The core group are opposed to giving them the equipment. But yes, they want to be able to, they need the equipment and the resources to fight the gang. Just as though, I mean, they're sending equipment to Israel and they're um, to fight um, the Palestinians. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. And they're sending equipment to Russia. Sorry, to Ukraine. Oh, okay. Or they're thinking about that. I mean, and we said that hate is right next door. And we said, what? They are going out of their way to get a foreign, foreign troops to send to Haiti when the Haitians are saying, give us we have police we have army give us the equipment or if you're going to send the troops send them so that to ensure that our police and army can do the work and not only that that the constitution is followed what's the constitution not for them to have an installed prime minister not for the installed prime minister to appoint judges and to appoint the installed prime minister that's appointed by by foreigners by the u.s and canada and so on Okay, they were for them to have to follow the constitution, the constitution that where that says, and um, the, the oldest member of 
the oldest member of the U.S. of the of their Supreme Court, to occupy the position until they can have elections and then like a prime minister and so on and so forth. And so what? So right now the con. So however, but we are seeing. But when you look at what's going on, you talk about it's as if the plan is for Haiti to continue to remain on weak, unstable. You know, outsiders are determining the the fate of this country of of and 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 CARICOM, which is established to observe and to preserve democracy and sovereignty. They are doing the exact opposite of their their institution and their charter and everything. And we as Caribbean people, what are we doing? I mean, what are we doing? What we what is the, what and that is why I say it's important for us to have the conversation. What are Caribbean people doing? What are academics doing? What is the church doing in the Caribbean? What are we doing to advocate for the Haitians in this regard? First, we have to understand what they're saying. Amongst the noise and so on, there is a unity in their, in their demand. There's a unity in their protest. First of all, it's, let's start with this. Haitians have pride, being the first free black, the first successful um, slave revolt. Okay, that's the first thing. Sec secondly, don't believe the lie that Haiti colonized Dominica Republic. They did not colonize Dominica Republic. That is all. It's, you know, Haitians are always being demonized. Yes, Alisa. Sir, I was just going to ask, because I, I agree with, with what you said. And so I wanted to know, if because I know that Haiti has been said to be one of the wealthiest or the wealthiest Caribbean country in terms of its resources. Yes, so I would yes. really like to know if it is that all of the natural resources have not been exhausted. Um, because I'm wondering if that is the reason why there seems to be a vendetta against this country. <laughs> because it, it it in terms of one of the final things that you had mentioned um about outsiders pulling pulling strings and then when you even consider the the reports in terms of how their their the their former president was assassinated and the involvement of persons from other countries. It's like, what is going on? And then, yeah, yeah. And, and I have a hard time with the fact that this country could have come together so beautifully and fought for their freedom. And yet they have a hard time standing together um, to, to, to defend themselves. Because even well, I'm yeah. not sure if it was mentioned at the beginning of the class, but a news item that I think came out either this week or late last week is the fact that Canada has deployed troops to Jamaica to teach Jamaicans and equip Jamaicans to help in the Haitian situation. That's a oh. news item now. And I'm just like, what? It's very like, what is going on? Wow. Well, we also, Canada sent. I mean, it's 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 look, it's Oh, so so what? Jamaica, some, wait, so is it is it that Jamaica is planning to send troops to Haiti? Right. So that's the plan. I'm going to pull it. Up. I'm going to pull it up again. That came out either this week or um late last week. So it let says, me say this. Let me say this. Hey, let me tell you. And and I'm on Facebook for del deliberately. You know, and I, I believe in education is important. And of course, uh, there are people who I want. I, I'm a, I believe in making popular what the monopoly. This class is important. Okay? I'm giving free information. I'm, this is... In, this, in order for society to get better, we have to have this the kind of conversi conversation. People have to know what's going on in society. People have to know the truth. Jamaicans have to know what's going on in society. Okay? So that we can hold our government um, accountable. I mean, CARICOM. How can... Car what it is that the Haitians want? How can Jamaica be sending or thinking about sending a troop? Why can't CARICOM give the um, trained? Why can't we get a group of, why can't we train the Haitians and give them the equipment to fight the gangs? Why can't, that is what they want. Well, let's start from there. Instead of training ex foreigners to, instead of foreigners training other foreigners to go to Haiti, why, let's start by training, providing equipment and, tr and resources to the police and the army so that they can fight, okay? So that they can fight, uh, so that they can um, fight the gangs. And also to ensure the rule of law and the constitution okay, is followed. And, okay, well, well, let's start with that. Because I'm, okay, 
Let us start with Ariel Henry. Um, you know, is an installed prime minister, and, and every decision that he makes is unconstitutional. And CARICOM cannot be a party to that. I mean, I'm telling you, this. Wow, this is interesting. This, we're going to end class in about five minutes. In fact, we will have to end class. We're going to end class earlier than because I didn't take any break. We started and we went full force. And then, um, so, but what a powerful class, guys. This is powerful. Thank you guys so much for joining the class. Next week, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to talk about voodoo and, I mean, we're going to talk about Afro Caribbean beliefs. And people, if you guys are on Facebook, this is powerful. Um, we've always been talking about Haiti. We have a petition advocating for a Haitian led solution, which I, I wasn't promoting it as much because of what was happening. But I didn't realize that there is still a need. There's still a desire for a Haitian-led solution um, because that's not what's happening. So go to the neoliberal.com. You can sign the petition. If you go to the neoliberal.com, T-H-E-N-E-O-L-I-B-E-R-A-L.com, go to uh, um, petition and causes, click on the Bob Marley picture. It's that way. No, sorry. That is not the Bob Marley picture. Sorry. No, no. There's somewhere where we're doing a, a petition for Haiti. Now, that's for people who are in the Caribbean or from the Caribbean diaspora, Jamaica, so on. But if you're in the U.S. or a U.S. national, we, you can also participate in the petition asking for a Haitian-led solution by going to HTTPS, um, semicolon forward, well, IJDH.org, IJDH, the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, which is an American organization run by Brian Concanen, who was an international human rights advocate and attorney who we've interviewed. He's been to the class to talk about what's going on in Haiti. There is still a need for a Haitian-led solution that recognizes Haitian democracy and constitution. CARICOM is built for that. What is going on? And what's going on with, what's going on with the U.S.? I'm an American, and I have a responsibility to, to hold the U.S. government um, responsible. I want to know what my government is doing in the world, to creating problems in other parts of the world. Because, okay, they are my brothers. They are my sisters. You are my brother. You are my sister. I have a responsibility. But what's going on? What's the policy towards Haiti, the American policy? It's draconian, okay? And it's antithetical to what the Haitian people are calling for. I, I'm very passionate about the class today and about what's going on in Haiti. And we spend much time in this class talking about Haiti because what the conversation about Haiti is a case study about what's about when you start to study post-colonialism or, po or what post-independent, what, what's going post-independent Caribbean, what's going on with, with the countries in the Caribbean since independence, since they got independence and freedom, what's going on, okay? And what's affecting their, their path to prosperity? The, comp the unfair competitive natures that of 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 the world today which uh, it's not in uh, you know it's interesting we're going to stop here that's it guys thank you guys um if you have any further questions you can email me you can please post and blog about it write about it go um participate in the in the in, in the in the petition that we have next week we're going to talk about we continue now we'll switch back to looking at afro caribbean beliefs looking at obia because say for example obia many jamaicans the Jamaican government did an amazing thing, announced the legalization of Obia. But many church people are against that. Okay? Yet we know Obia is a tradition or a practice that's practiced by who? Revivalists. But so we are willing to discriminate based on our inherited colonial past against a tradition that we have been misinformed about. We're going to talk about Obia and what it is really. Okay? And um, and we would we'll, we'll talk some more about this. Thank you, guys. And I actually wrote an article which I submitted to the Gleaner, and uh, which I started talking about. Or I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna end the class by 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 sharing an article I submitted to the Jamaican Gleaner, and I want I hope they publish it because I want all Jamaica to hear this. It says the edited Sir Madame re-exploring changing attitudes towards Afro Caribbean beliefs and tradition in Jamaica. I'm conducting a research study on valuing African identity religious affirmations of afro caribbean belief and traditions by examining and exploring the changing attitudes towards afro caribbean belief and traditions in jamaica and by extension the caribbean the study aims to shed light on the impact of socio-political factors religion education pop culture travel experiences and exposure on the evolving perceptions of jamaica now the findings will continue 
to a deeper understanding of how societal changes influence cultural attitudes, promoting inclusivity, tolerance, and cultural heritage, preservation, and so on. Ultimately, this research aims to encourage a more informed and respectful dialogue surrounding Afro-Caribbean beliefs in Jamaican society and by extension the Caribbean. Now, and the diaspora in the US or all over the Americas. Now in Jamaica, there has historically been a negative perception towards African and indigenous spiritual practices, religious beliefs, customs, and faiths that draw influences from urban Indian heritage or African tradition, Rastafari. So, so we're talking about Rastafarianism, Obia, Voodoo, Pokomania, or Poko Church. Um, revivalists and Muslim beliefs have often been marginalized, deemed as fringe, demonic, and unpopular, juxtaposed against the inherited tradition from European colonialism. Now, the Judeo-Christian faiths, such as Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and Evangelicalism, have, have been favored or has been favored and considered closer to the truth and the ideal. However, in the 21st century, with increased exposure, awareness, critical thinking, and a more liberal lifestyle, in a sense, what some people will say, particularly among the younger generation, it is crucial to investigate whether attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs are changing. Now, this study aims to explore the shifting attitudes of Jamaicans and the factors contributed to the changes, considering demographic variables such as location, age, group, educational levels, income status, political affiliation, denominationality, and religious beliefs. Now, while updating the research and reviewing the, the, the responses, I came across an article in the Jamaica Gleaner, which was the letter of the day that confirms the initial assessment about the study we are conducting. And it highlights why this study is important as a class exploring attitudes toward Afro-Caribbean beliefs. Now, we asserted that in Jamaica, there has, in the study, we had asserted that in Jamaica, there has always been a negative attitude towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs. We have made that assertion, and the assertion is not, it is a fact because over a year ago, the Jamaican government, the Jamaica Labour Party government announced it would open discussions to have the 122 year old OB um, um, Act repealed. When the announcement was made, many Jamaicans and church groups rallied together to fight the motion. Their main argument was that OB is inherently evil. And of course, you can see the Jamaica Letter of the Day article um, dated the, um, November 27, 2020, um, called OB is not evil it is spiritual healing now caribbean unity and i've and of course next week we're going to continue the country i i would release i will talk some more about this we've already done i've done a lecture in the past should culture transcend um should, should theology transcend culture which put this into perspective but caribbean unity and black and brown people's unity threatens the, the status quo or those who are privileged when i talk about the status quo what pertains today as privilege, those who, okay. So the plan was and is always to implement strategies that create this unity. And I define the dominant class as those who are part of the status quo, which we talk about in neoliberal globalization, reconsidered. We'll talk about that, the financiers, so on and so forth. We'll explore that some more later. So the plan was and is always to implement strategies that create this unity, such as rejecting and diluting their language as Creole, Religion, faith, practices as evil for a Eurocentric one. The very same thing that the church is saying is what was in, that has been ingrained in us. Hence, we want to rediscover our unity. We want to discover, because you see what is going on here. The church is against the legalization of, of that, calling it evil. That threatens unity because there are those in Jamaica that practice it the revivalist traditions, and there are others who practice that tradition, not as, not um, to conduct evil, but for healing and for other things. There are people who who would say, um, who would who would wish people bad in Jesus' name. Does that make um, Jesus or the religion bad? No, there are those who use it for bad. Now, the Caribbean unity. So I said to you. Caribbean unity and black and brown people's unity threaten the status quo. So the plan was and is always to implement strategies that create this unity. Hence, we want to rediscover our unity by revisiting our history and the changing attitudes toward Afro-Caribbean beliefs and traditions in Jamaica and the Americas. How did we get here? The fact that the Jamaican government announced 
to announcement to open discussions on legalizing Obia created such backlash from some, particularly the Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, and Protestant churches, is an indication of what continues to drive this unity among our people. Obia is a practice that is found even within um, um, even within some Jamaican faith traditions, such as revivalists. The very idea that the church openly disagreed with the move by the Jamaican government to have a national discussion on the issue, calling it evil, is an indication of the, the, of the divide and the discrimination within our system, driven by an inherited colonial past that we are yet to get beyond. Hence, this study and the Jamaican government's plan to discuss the issue and to, okay, about repealing it, is timely and welcomed, or are timely and welcomed, as we can dispel or move to dispel some of the misinformation and encourage diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Only then will we realize true independence, unity, and prosperity. Okay. Now, the study, if you, you can go to ResearchGate, Ronaldo McKenzie, to participate in the study and learn more, you can go to, um, we can go to the neoliberal.com to, and where the study is also available, you can, where I have links to the study, so on and so forth. And, uh, but thank you guys so much. Or you can email us at ronaldo.mckenzie at jts.edu.jm. Okay. And that's it for class today. For people who are on Facebook who are joining us, thank you so much. This was Caribbean Thought Lecture, Lecture 10. Thank you guys so much. And uh, we are contending for Caribbean issues, critical is issues. And this is a very important class. Um, so thank you guys for joining the class. I'm going to um, stop.